Hello everyone, it is Joe here from Omnipoke, the channel that brings you guys everything Pokemon. If you're looking for PTCGO codes, make sure you check out the Potown store. You can even get a 5% discount on your orders using that code Omnipoke. For today's video, it's finally time for the Sword and Shield set review. I've been really looking forward to this one. The set has over 200 cards and there's plenty of influential stuff. Ball Search is finally returning, we get some great supporters and a handful of amazing Pokemon as well. So we're going to be jumping into the set review now and you'll be familiar with these ratings I hope at this point. But pause now if you want to um, get a little bit of a better picture of why we rate cards the way we do. Keep an eye out on the top right corner for the rating themselves and I'll be discussing the cards throughout anyways. We also get to take a look at the community's rating. Normally I put a majority rating in the corner, but this time around I've gone ahead and just copied and pasted the whole pie chart just to get a better view of the split of the community to see if everyone's all in agreement on certain cards. Sometimes it's interesting to see when there are split decisions where some people aren't sure or there isn't really a consensus over how strong a card actually is. That can be a good little thing to mention. So you don't only have to take my word for it for how decent a card is, you can also take a look uh, in this area to see the pie chart to see where um, the community rated these. Thanks so much for everyone who got involved with this rating system. Uh, we got over 120 responses, I think. Um, so that's overall just really good stuff, um, seeing as though I only gave you a couple days notice. So that's a fantastic support and it really does help out the video. So let's go on to the ratings, starting off with the supporter cards. And we start off with bead. Uh, you get to attach a basic energy card from your hand to one of your benched Pokemon. Pretty simple effects. There are a few similar effects that we previously have seen. Uh, Mina allowed you to attach additional fair energies. That was from the deck. Uh, well, one fair energy from deck. Uh, so obviously Mina was very limited because it was only fairy Pokemon, so it didn't really have many good targets. End Resolve has been a sort of flop supporter that we saw in the previous set, even though there were great receivers of energy like Arceus Palkia Dialga, who is pretty much at the top of the game pre-Sword and Shield. Um, so it's interesting to see that these predecessors have pretty much not done well overall, and that's what leads me to le believe that Bead won't be that successful. However, I do think there are a decent number of receivers of a little bit of extra energy acceleration. We go back to Arceus Dialga Palkia. The reason why you may prefer Bead to End Resolve is you're not discarding uh, resources at will uh, like you do with an N, which can sometimes be very, very detrimental. You're much more in control with this Bead, so it could speed up the Altered Creation GX and ultimately get you into your ultimate rate a turn earlier, which can be fantastic for you. Uh, there's also things like uh, the new Dede uh, Morpeko V, I almost said Dedene, uh, Morpeko V um, that has a three energy attack cost. Now it is a lightning type, so it has a bunch of different ways that it can accelerate, but every time Morpeko V does attack, uh, at least with its second attack, you have to discard an energy from it. So making sure that you can power up a second Morpeko V uh, can sometimes be a really important deal. So squeezing in one or two copies of this card may be reasonable. Same thing for the Sableye V, its best attack. Um, requires two dark energy so just having again just these one or two floating copies in your list to sort of shield you from your opponent just being this big one hit KO merchant that can get through your guys very easily um, make sure that you can uh, always mount comeback attacks even if you have multiple energy attachments uh, all to be done in one turn so myself and the community are overall in alignment with this card i think more so just for the history of previous uh, options that we've had in supporters never being all that successful. It's annoying that you always need to have an energy in hand. It might force you to play additional cards in your deck, like energy retrieval and such, just to make sure this card is live. Or you'd sort of have this option as just a one or two count in your deck to sort of safeguard you from your opponent just really out-tempoing you uh, with very strong early game. So um, overall, just the two-star rating. I can see it being experimented with, uh, but never really in a high count. Next up, we come on to Hop. It's the new version of How Sharon Tieno. We can go further and further back with these, uh, but it's just a simple flat draw three. As you can see, the community are pretty much stonewall saying this is terrible. We've known that all of these predecessors have been terrible, and we have Cynthia Caitlin currently in our format, which is a tag callable, means that can draw us three cards and also get us back supporter cards. So Hop will basically never see play in standard. Marnie is a much more interesting supporter card. It forces both players to shuffle their hands and then put those cards to the bottom of their decks. You get to draw five, your opponent gets to draw four. So it's a judge on steroids uh, because you get yourself 
basically a Shauna effect, but it's actually better than a Shauna effect because you know that you will not draw back into the cards that were in your hand previously. Usually, before using the money, you will put down as many Insta playables as possible and just put the cards that you don't want to play that turn to the bottom of the deck, save them for later, while you can get a fresh five. So it's like a draw five, really, for you, which is great. And your opponents also cannot access those cards, so it can give you that information. If your opponent has been using cards previously, if they've been stellar wishing for certain pieces, you've seen them pick up a custom catcher here or there, you've seen them pick up a reset stamp and not use it um, the previous turn, you can money that away knowing that it's right at the bottom of their deck, so it's much more difficult for them to re-access that card unless they have certain abilities or whatever else that can force the opponent to shuffle their deck again. So putting them far out of reach from the opponent can be very, very good for you and it's great disruption. I'm giving this a 5 star. I think there are plenty of archetypes that are really yearning to have this effect. We've seen Judge Picaron be successful in the past, and there are a few other great cards in this set that but leads me to believe that Pikachu and Zekrom could be a big contender in the format once again. Uh, Morpeko V again springs to mind because it is a hit-and-run style deck. It's also a V Pokemon, so it can only be accessed um, by... Ninetales or Custom Catchers, the latter being the more important one, because Marnie can disrupt people from getting a combination of Customs in hand all at once, and every turn that you evade getting Custom with more Pekko, you get a really big payoff of a lot of damage a lot of the time. And also, uh, recently in Japan, we've seen um, Mewtwo builds pair up with Malamar in the new Sword and Shield meta, because there's better Ball Search available, and Welder variants are far less useful now that we have the new Turn 1 Supporter rules, of course. Um, so people have been opting to go for Psychic builds of Mewtwo instead, and Marnie is a focal point in that build as well, because you're forcing your opponent down to four cards, and then on top of that you usually try and use Mewtwo and Mew to copy a Trevenant and Dust Noir attack to leave your opponent with two cards. So it's a very hand-locky, disruptive archetype from the Mewtwo side that could be coming out uh, in droves come Sword and Shield. It might be the new, most popular way of playing Mewtwo. For that reason, I'm giving it a 5-star. Mewtwo currently the best deck in format. Um, and there's also a reason for me to believe that more Pekko and Pikachu and Zekrom will be successful decks. So Marnie going to get the 5-star. The community a little bit less hyped on it, but still a handful of people definitely respecting it as much as I do. We move on to Poker Kid. You get to search your deck for a Pokemon, reveal it and put it into your hand, then shuffle your deck. Again, we've got a predecessor for this. Trevor does exactly the same thing. Um, but unfortunately, Poker Kid is coming out in a format where we get amazing item ball search. We get Quick Ball, we get Evolutionary Incense, we already have Pokemon Communication, there's even things like Great Ball coming out in this set. So, Poker Kid may have been a card that saw play in different formats. For example, um, pre-Sword and Shield, when we didn't have such amazing ball search, you could consider this card going into decks, although even then it probably wouldn't. Um, but it's pretty much a nail in the coffin now that we have such amazing access to our Pokemon via item cards. This Poker Kid is very rarely ever going to see play unless item lock sprouts up at some point. We move on to Professor's Research. This is Professor Magnolia, of course. You discard your hand, then draw seven. Again, it's a repeat effect that we've seen on previous supporter cards. Discard your hand, draw seven. This is just bread and butter amazing. Accessing a fresh seven cards really helps you dig through your deck. You can discard cards that aren't useful to you. And it's even coming in a set where we get some great recovery pieces. So the downside of discard is, well, can be mitigated by decks if they choose to by adding in the new fishing rod as well. You can see the community are very much in agreement here that this is a phenomenal five-star card. Uh, I tend to agree. Uh, there are so many archetypes that can benefit from this. Pikachu and Zekrom, uh, Malamar, Mewtwo, they all really want to have, well, and the Ganadol based decks. These all love discard synergy. They love getting energy in the discard pile, or in Mewtwo's case, Pokemon. Um, and Professor's Research gives you the discard effect, as well as getting you access to seven fresh cards. So just a very powerful supporter that makes you see a lot of cards. Make sure you still have plenty to do in the future turn. It's a great dig for you, and it's going to be taking over plenty of draw engines for certain as a four of. We move on to Sonya. This is a spiritual reprint, really, to Roseanne's research. It's slightly different. It allows you to search your deck for up to two basic Pokemon or up to two basic energy. Reveal them and put them into your hand. So it's slightly different to Roseanne's because Roseanne's could also give you the option of having one and one, whereas Sonya only gives you up to two of one and then up to two of another, I believe, is how it's going to read. Uh, so it's not quite the same as Roseanne's. A little bit less powerful. Um, 
But that's not the reason why I'm giving it a two star. The reason I'm giving this a two star rating is because mainly the term one supporter rule changes. Let me just go over this again. Um, essentially, the player going first is no longer able to play a supporter card under the sword and shield rules. And that's going to be a really big deal for supporters that just simply get you basics and gets you set up in a way. So cards like Elm's Lecture, Oak Setup, Sonya, these are all going to be hit, in my opinion, um, because they are just less usable and less helpful uh, when they're not able to be used on turn one, exactly. So uh, I think Sonya gets caught in that crossfire. I also think it doesn't really sh um, shape up that well compared to the things like Elms and Oaks. Um, so she's not super powerful in comparison. There might be some niche scenarios where having the option to get the energy is just more important. For example, making sure you have an energy drop in ADP, uh, similar for Sableye V and even Frostmoth style decks. Having that option to get you early Snoms and Laprases and then late game that Sonya can be just grabbing you energies out of the deck could be a nice synergy that you have going on there. But overall, I'm going to give it the two for nothing more than experimentation. Uh, mainly because of my um, curiosity with the new Term 1 rule changes and how I think it affects supporters such as her. Team Yell Grunt um, forces um, an energy from your opponent back into their hand. Uh, this is kind of similar to a Nita style effect um, and is much worse than a Team Flare Grunt style effect. Uh, Nita was only usable on basics, but this card basically never saw play. Um, and Flare Grunt was a discard, which is way, way stronger than forcing it back into your opponent's hand. Um, putting it back in their hand is more of an anti-tempo play than it is a disruption play. And as we know, disruption is spoilt for choice right now. Uh, there are so many great ways that we can remove energies if you are going to be a controlling base deck. Pidgeotto Control and Florgus are both two control decks that we currently have in our format. Pidgeotto is the only one that really goes for energies a lot of the time, but they are spoilt for choice. They have Cold Crush that they can try and spam with Missy and Lorelei, the tag team supporter, and they have just Raw Crushing Hammer spam over and over again. And if you wanted to make that more um, guaranteed, you could even splash in that Will supporter in order to guarantee an energy um, removal. So I think Team Yell Gr uh, Grunt is currently outclassed by these options in controlling decks, and I don't think it's a strong enough supporter to be an anti-tempo tool as sort of a tech card option. I could see this being really annoying against things like ADP and stuff like that, just because if you are teching a Team Yell Grunt, it would be really frustrating. Um, but I don't think it's going to ever see play for that reason alone. I think there are other options that you could have. You could just play your own hammers. You could do all this other stuff that I think is probably just stronger in general. So Team Yell Grunt, not really one for me. And the community seems to give it a bit more respect. But overall, no one's too hyped on the card. Energy Retrieval is a returning um, card. Good to see it come back. You simply put two basic energy from your discard pile into your hand. I think there are two obvious synergistic cards. The new uh, Frostmoth deck coming out really loves um, rain dancing energies into play. Um, so obviously recovering energies when one of your Pokemon's knocked out or if you've played something like a Professor's Research or something like that uh, is obviously a great deal for you. And we've seen uh, Blacephalon max out Fire Crystal. And in fact, when we used to have energy retrieval in our format, um, pre-rotation, they would play crystals and energy retrievals as well, and giving them the option to get more energy retrievals, essentially 100 damage in one item card, um, is pretty good. Obviously, it's worse than a fire crystal, but you pretty much just lump them in in addition to the crystals to make sure you have enough firepower uh, to get over things with Fireball Circus. So, yeah, seems like an obvious include to Baby Blacephalon. I think Baby Blacephalon actually low-key gets a good number of tools in this set. I think Retrieval and also Lucky Egg that we'll talk about later. I think those are two very, very big cards for Baby Blounds. Um, so I feel like that could be a threatening archetype in the future. And the community, exactly the same, um, rating it at that three-star. Energy Search is worse than Energy Spinner, so I won't waste any more time on it. As long as we have Spinner in the format, we don't need to look at this card. Evolutionary Incense allows you to search your deck for an Evolution Pokemon and put it straight into your hand, then shuffle your deck. This is a buffed version of Evo Soda because it goes to hand rather than instantly onto a Pokemon that's on your board. So you can use it as a deck thinning piece. Um, you can use it just for Pokemon communication value if you need to get a basic out even. Um, and it just helps you like deck thin in general. And also the biggest upside is that it helps you get stage two Pokemon uh, and you're able to then rare candy. Whereas Evo Soda would basically make you go through all the stages of evolution. 
Um, I'm rating this as a four star. The community are pretty close on this as well, between a four and a five, uh, because it is a great Pokemon search with no drawback. I do think there is some chance for a decent number of evolution decks in the format. I've um, put some of the, my most favored ones on the slide right now. Uh, I know in Japan there's been a decent number of Mag Cargo GX, regular Mag Cargo decks come together, sometimes using that Torkoal V from the new set as well. Um, and they will obviously love to have Evolution Incense. I think also there's the Sableye V um, Obstagoon, Galarian Goons deck. Trying to get those into play can be pretty nice. Lapras and Frostmoth are two stage ones. And there's even the option now for us to bring back Meganium. Uh, the Meganium decks were something... To behold, really, they were pretty rogue always, but there were some great combos coming together with Meganium, uh, like Swamper and all these other things coming together. And I think Evolution Incense can breathe some life back into the archetype. It's really been lacking the ball search to sustain itself right now. There's also a new Inteleon that we'll get onto later that can help search out some item cards. So grabbing yourself an Evolution Incense off of Inteleon's ability also sounds amazing. So I can foresee a decent number of Evolution decks coming into the format. None of these I think will end up being, you know, completely top tier archetypes, but for the sort of versatility that Evolution Incense can go into, I'm still gonna give it the four star. One thing to note, I still believe that you will play, you know, like four quick ball and probably like three or four communication before even thinking about putting too many evolution incense in your deck. So I can see this deck or this card really being like a two of even if it's in evolution decks. I think it'll be very rare that it becomes a full on four of because usually you'll still want to have a good number of Pokemon communications so that you can get enough basic Pokemon down. Basics are still integral, of course, for evolutions. And when you're not able to use a supporter on your first turn, you will really love having a good number of comms and quick balls at your disposal to get an army of Slugmas, an army of um, Nidorans or whatever else. Get those down first. The evolution incense may only end up being like a one or two of even in these evolution decks because first you've got to get the basics down after all. We move on to Fishing Rod now. Um, this is a fantastic means of recovery. We have been really lacking recovery pieces for a long time. This card allows you to shuffle up to two Pokemon and up to two basic energy cards from your discard pile into your deck. This is two thirds of a Brock's Grit Supporter in an item card, which is just absolutely phenomenal for you. You don't have to waste your one-off supporter for turn, and it gives you a good amount of Pokemon recovery as well as basic energy recovery if you want to, and that's the best deal here. Um, you can um, mix and match for cards that you want. You don't have to pad your deck out with cards that you don't want to recover into your deck that can make you weak to reset stamp later on if you don't want to. So you can cherry pick the cards that are exactly important at the right time and get a good number of those cards back. I think it competes pretty well with Energy Recycle System. It competes very well with the Lana's Fishing Rod, one of the other um, item-based Pokemon recoveries we have in the format right now. So I can foresee plenty of non-GX uh, and non-V Pokemon, basically the single prize decks, uh, wanting to have this effect. I think many of the um, multiple prize attacking decks probably still won't use Fishing Rod. That's why I'm only giving it the four star, um, because I think... Rarely a game goes long enough um, that you need like more energy to actually use the fishing rod, if that makes sense. Normally, you just want to force your opponent to take like three knockouts on like one three prize Pokemon, then a two prize Pokemon, then a three prize Pokemon. And usually, your deck will be equipped with enough energies and, and Pokemon to force your opponent through that method. It's against the non GX stuff where the fishing rod is going to be absolutely clutch. I've got a bunch of these at the bottom of the slide, and also I'm giving a nod to the controlling archetypes. I'm certain that they would want to have a fishing rod style effect in their deck. I remember the Rescue Stretcher being a really, really good card in um, Pidgeot to control, sometimes more than a one of in the deck, just because it was so important to regain access instantly to an Oranguru or instantly to a Pidgeotto and such. It means that you can, well, you're only forced to resource management back this fishing rod rather than getting all the individual pieces of the Pidgeotto lines if they are targeted by the opponent. So that gives you a bit more breathing space with your resource management, which can be very important. I also think we've seen archetypes like Shedinja work in the past where they were trying to spam Brock's Grit every turn. Fishing Rod again opens up for you to recover the Shedinja over and over again. So I think all of these non-GX decks will really love having the Fishing Rod involved. 
And in more general terms, even, you can see either side of the Shedinja, I've just got Acrobike and Professor's Research. Decks have more license to go aggressive, discard a bunch of things, knowing that you have one of Fishing Rod in your list, just to make sure you can recover those pieces and give you more license to play these aggressive supporter and item cards to cycle through your deck very quickly, knowing that you can recover pieces if need be. Um, so yeah, the Fishing Rod going to be amazing for non-GX decks, may end up seeing play in some multiple prize attacking decks uh, as well, especially if they are going to rely on the likes of Bikes and Professor's Research just to get back some important pieces. So I can really foresee this card being oftentimes a one-of, but a really important one-of in many decks. We move on to Great Ball. Now, Great Ball recently, like the last time we saw it in Shining Legends, it was actually a pretty played card. Um, because Zoroark was that desperate to be able to get basics and stage ones out. I think now it's much less the case. I think we are spoiled for ball search once again. I'll reiterate that Evolution Incense, Calm, and Quick Ball are all fantastic pieces that we gain in this set. However, there still might be a need for Great Ball, and a similar reason why I said that Evolutionary Incense will only be like a one or two of index because you may prefer things like Great Ball, even though they're not guaranteed. You look at the top seven and hope to find a Pokemon, and then you put it straight to your hand. Um, but because it can also grant you access to basic Pokemon, and there are some decks that are going to be out there that just say the more the merrier for basics, especially when you're going first, you can't use a supporter, you're going to really breathe a sigh of relief if you can access Quick Balls, Great Balls, Pokemon Communications to get as many down as possible. I think if you're a Magkargo get a deck, you want an army of Slugma, you want to get an army of um, all these basics down, really. You want to get some Whoopers and some Poiples down, you want to get Zigzagoons down, you want to get everything you can see on the screen and a bunch of other like small evolution decks. Like If you go back to the previous slide on the Super Rod, or sorry, the Fishing Rod as well, um, all of those sorts of decks could consider Great Ball as an option. Again, probably just a low count, just in addition to Quick Balls and Comms. Um, but it could just grant you more access to basics in those only turns to guarantee decent setups throughout the game. The great thing about uh, Great Ball is that it's good pretty much throughout the game. It's not just used um, to get that early game help, like Quick Ball can be for some of these evolution decks, but it can also help you maintain uh, a decent chain of attackers and stuff for your stage 1s and 2s. So yeah, overall Great Ball could be a nice addition to decks to make sure you get your Pokemon out, especially if you have a very high count of Pokemon. Things like uh, Lost March, they are notorious for having, you know, a 20 or so Pokemon count, so they have enough damage for the Lost March itself. And uh, Quagnag, known for having a very high Pokemon count. Volcarona GX decks are probably going to have a high Pokemon count as well. So all of these could really benefit from Great Ball. I'm just giving it the two count because I think oftentimes the other things on the screen, the Quick Ball, the Incense, and the Com, they go in first, but Great Ball is an afterthought if you have more spaces in your deck or you want to commit more spaces to getting those basics down. Hyper Potion allows you to discard two energy from one of your Pokemon and heal 120 damage from the Pokemon you discarded two energies from. This is essentially the Super Potion effect doubled. Now, we never really see Super Potion see play. Uh, the last time we had it in format was in Evolutions, and it was really terrible. No one ever played it at all. Now, lumping, a lumping the effect of two cards into one is very, very good because you get double the bang for your buck. Um really. You're getting that double heal effect to a meaningful number, really. 120 damage is a meaningful amount of heal. We've seen that effect from Malo and Lana and how much it can change. It can turn, you know, two shots into three shots, and that can be really, really influential in the format. Now, I think, unfortunately, Hyper Potion comes out at the time where Malolana is in the format and is a very searchable supporter thanks to the tag call engine at that. So I think the downside of discarding two energy, not many decks can bear that. I think oftentimes you would prefer to use that Malolana. I'm yet to really see many decks that I want to squeeze a Hyper Potion into. I don't think I have natural deck spaces for this. And even if I did, it feels like you're just having to instantly recommit to a Pokemon anyway with things like Hyper Potion. At first, I was thinking like maybe some Welder-based decks can try and use this uh, to get some recovery, and then you instantly Welder those energies back on. 
but oftentimes these welder decks they want to access four, five, six energy attack costs, and hyper potion is just getting you like distracting you from that overall game plan. So I'm rating it as a two for some experimentation because I do value that amount of heal, but the discard is overall a little bit too painful. I was pretty close to putting this a one star as well, but I've held out because that healing does still seem pretty relevant. Metal Saucer is a huge card from this set. <clears throat> it allows you to attach a metal energy from your discard to one of your benched metal Pokemon. This is a reprint of, you know, the Aqua Patch, the Dark Patch. Now we finally get the Metal Saucer. And boy, do we have some good targets for this. I think everyone who remembers the Dark Patch era knows exactly how crazy this item is. If you've only seen the Aquapatch era, you may be a little bit warped on how strong this item actually was. Aquapatch was in a weird spot where it actually didn't have enough good targets throughout its entire lifespan. They were very, very careful with the targets Aquapatch had available. It was basically things like Lapras GX as some of the best receivers of Aquapatch, which is overall very underpowered. Metal Saucer comes out in a set that also has possibly the best Pokemon in the set in this Zacian V. Zacian V does 230 for 3 metal, very good value when you consider Metal Saucer can help you access those energies, and its own ability can also uh, help with energy acceleration. So I think there's some amazing synergy here. Zacian V is a phenomenal card that we're getting from the set. Lucario Melmetal is another um, handy metal type that we've seen previously see success. So it's a pretty obvious 5 star for me. This item just has great synergy um, with, again, Acrobikes, Professor's Research, um, quick ball, so many means of discarding energies now, so Metal Saucer should be live very often in games. It really help you turbo out your Zacians for damage output, or get you towards higher damage output with Lucario and Melmetal as well. So these are going to be very good. It's going to be part of Arceus Palkia Dialga, while they go away from the high water energy count towards a higher metal energy count to incorporate the Zacian. And there's, of course, the Zacian Luke Metal deck that go into one, um, and even there's straight Zacian decks as well that just use this and Per Circa to increase your damage output. So all of these seem very viable. Metal Saucer is going to be at the forefront of that, uh, carrying Zacian to make sure it can get attacking very quickly and efficiently. The community agrees. Um, the Saucer is absolutely phenomenal and it's going to be a four of in every metal deck, basically. Pokemon Catcher also is getting a reprint in this set. Flip a coin if heads, switch one of your opponent's benched Pokemon with their active. Now, in the format currently, none of our gusting effects are quite perfect. Uh, Custom Catcher requires you to get that combination of two at once, and because you can only play a four of, you can only use Custom Catcher, you know, ideally two times on targets. Uh, Great Catcher, only usable for GXs and EXs, and we're moving into an era where V Pokemon might start to dominate. Ninetales probably has the best gusting effect of the bunch here. Uh, but it is on a stage 1 and is only accessible for fire types. And Fion isn't really a gust so much as forcing something out of the way. Uh, so Pokemon Catcher is coming in at a time where it can access any Pokemon on the bench. Simply if you flip heads. And that's obviously a big risk. Um, but I can certainly foresee this card going in in addition to a couple of Great Catcher in certain decks. Just to grant you that sometimes access to... Um, non-GX, non-EX Pokemon, um, which could be a pretty big deal. And in some cases, I can see you just going for straight up four Pokemon catchers. If the format ends up panning out where more Peko V is that impressive, or any of, the, or any of these other V Max decks start taking over the format, you may just need that Pokemon catcher instead of any of these other options. I really do think this could be the way we go. Quick note on Will as well, uh, the supporter that allows you to dictate the outcome of a coin flip. Now, I don't think we're going to start seeing Will Pokemon Catcher packages unless it's going to be in an archetype where you're already playing Super Scoop Ups or Crushing Hammers. Now, we do know that um, the Pidgeotto Control deck often plays Crushing Hammers and sometimes plays a copy of Will. I can certainly see them shifting away from the three count of customs to a two count of regular, uh, regular Pokemon Catcher. It buys them a space, which is very, very valuable in Pidgeotto Control, actually. Um, so that can certainly be a thing. Also, with some VMAXs, with the silly amount of hit points that they have, having Will scoop up as a combo may, may just be worth it. Um, it might end up being that Malo and Lana isn't enough heal, so having Will scoop up and also having Will catcher available, essentially turning the Will supporter into... 
Um, an Acerola plus a Lysander. That's a really good supporter, but of course it's always combining with item cards. But I thought it was worth noting uh, that we do have a supporter that can make Catcher more reliable. Um, but I do foresee this card seeing play in addition sometimes to great catchers, sometimes instead of customs, depending on a few things like deck space for certain lists. It might just be too much to fit for custom catchers, and sometimes um, it just ends up being that the Pokemon catcher is better because you don't have an engine that can support custom catchers, something that doesn't help you scout items very frequently. For example, if you're not a Jirachi-based engine, if you're not a Greens engine, these sorts of things, the catcher might just be more live, more reliable uh, than trying to get two customs in hand once or twice in the game. So I'm going to give it that three stars as an option, um, but it's never always going to like be a four of index, I don't think. It's going to be a pick-and-choose basis uh, based on certain deck lists. We move on to Potion. It's one of these cards that we always get given in uh, brand new sets. Um, you just heal 30 from a Pokemon. Now, there are some Pokemon that like having prerequisite damage to increase their damage output. Uh, obviously, we've seen Clampter Slash be very strong recently. And the new Sable IV um, does damage based on the amount of damage counters already on the opponent. Um, but I don't think Potion is a strong enough effect in a vacuum to really see play. We did see Great Potion have a decent amount of players, like one or two of in green space builds, but I think Potion is much more niche, so we're going to give it the one star. Quick Ball is a really, really good card. This is one of the best cards we've seen in a long time. I really do think this effect is bonkers. You discard one card from hand in order to play this Search your deck for a basic and put it straight into your hand. This is, for for basically for um, all basic decks, this is an Ultra Ball that only ever discards one. So it's a better version of Ultra Ball, which was a four of in almost every deck throughout its lifetime, essentially. And it is an upgrade from Nest Ball. Uh, you do have to discard a card in order to use this, but getting one to hand means that you get to use coming into play effects. The most notable one in the format right now, the Dene GX. You get to put the Dene to hand and go ahead and Dene change immediately. Nest Ball can never do that for you. Um, so this is just obviously phenomenal. Discard Synergy is great for many decks. Pikachu and Zekrom, Mewtwo, uh, Malamar, they all love to have Discard Synergy. Uh, you also get to Deck Thin in general, which is fantastic for you. And yeah, like I said, coming into play effects are fantastic. What I also really like about this, something that we've really been lacking in the format for a long time, just in an era with Tag, Call, and Cherish Ball, and then just having to rely on Pokemon communication, Quick Ball opens up the option for us to use lots of tech non-GX Pokemon these days. A lot of tech one prizes that were much more harder to scout out and find at the right times, we will find a lot easier in the Sword and Shield format. So... Although we have seen things like Mew, Absol, Fion, Marshadow, Mimikyu, they've all seen a decent amount of play. They get way, way stronger when you're able to access them that much more at the opportune moment. So they just become even better tools in your arsenal. And I think something that we've seen sort of fade out uh, post-rotation was the use of some non-GX attackers. Things like Buzzwell, Zapdos, Hooper, these cards became way less accessible and therefore you couldn't find them at the opportune moments and they became way less useful. I think with the Quick Ball era, we could easily start seeing some of these one energy single prizes coming back into relevancy and becoming really useful cards again in certain archetypes. So this is going to be a four of in a whole heap of decks for certain. I think every all basic deck will play a four of this. And then even, you know, evolution decks, they probably still play four copies of this because it gets them their main basics out and also grants them access to the Dene to draw them a bunch of cards to make your decks overall way more consistent. Easy, easy five-star card. This is incredible for all decks, basically. We move on to Rotom Bike. It allows you to draw until you have six cards in your hand, but your turn ends. Now, <laughs> uh, that's a really, really big drawback. Uh, Think of things like Tropical Beach, Blue's Tactics, and Ends Resolve when you start thinking about this. You'd never really get to instantly use those cards. Now, I understand why this card was printed. Um, it was printed at the same time we got this rule change where you're not able to use a supporter on your first turn. So in theory, if you're the player going first, Rotom Bike could be your best friend in order to get yourself a handful of cards and get yourself drawing through your deck. But the main thing is, you can't use those cards that you've just drawn until the following turn. So it is really, really slow, and it's only ever usable, really, if you are first going on that first turn. So uh, in order to 
get value from this, you want to play a high count of this, um, so you can actually find it on turn one without using a supporter. Basically, you need it in hand. Um, and every other time, this card is pretty much useless for you. So, yeah, unlike Tropical Beach, where it was at least a stadium bump, unlike uh, Stevens Resolve, where it was useful throughout the game because it was tutoring specific pieces um, in controlling decks, Rotom Bike is just a random bit of additional draw, whereas controlling decks are trying to um, accumulate hands. That's why Stevens is far stronger and Blues Tactics never saw play. This is essentially a Blues Tactics in my eyes. The Rotom Bike is very, very poor. Although we are really starved for item draw cards, we only really have Acrobike and potentially Pokenav if you accept that as a <laughs> potential draw card. Um, we are really yearning for some more item-based draw, and I feel like in the Sword and Shield format, especially with um, supporters being less effective turn one, we will get more in future. Um, I just think this one is certainly not what we're looking for. Interestingly, interestingly enough, uh, the community have had a bit of a mixed opinion on this. Some of them are yearning for some item-based draw, but this isn't the one we're looking for, guys, for sure. We move on to the tools now, uh, starting off with Air Balloon. This is almost as good as Floatstone. Uh, you re your retreat cost is reduced by two when attached to the Pokemon. That's a pretty big deal. Obviously, in the format right now, we do have a skateboard, which is a minus one and also helps you get around some statuses. And we do have that uh, U-turn board, which is only a minus one as well, but it, you can keep recovering it as long as it doesn't get fabbed away. Um, Air Balloon giving you that extra minus of retreat does open up the doors for Dormings Necrozma GX. I think that's one of the biggest reasons why this card might see play. We get to have the Air Balloon Dawn Wings combo, which is essentially the new age version of Keldeo Float for those people who have been playing long enough, where you can just invasion and retreat around your stuff um, to hop in and out of the active with ease, which is pretty reasonable overall. Gets you around status, gets you back to the bench so you can use things like Metal Saucer or use your Frost Moth. All these sorts of things could be very reasonable. So I can see Dormwing's Air Balloon pretty much going hand in hand in a lot of different packages as sometimes a low count. It's really easy to have low counts of tools in the format right now because we do have Tag Call Goose Mahala engine. So even if you just play one or two copies of Air Balloon, it should be pretty accessible as should the Dormwing's now that we have a Quick Ball accessible. So that could be a nice combo for certain. I do think a lot of the time, Jirachi engines are still bread and butter, absolutely phenomenal. So I think the reason why I'm not rating Air Balloon higher, more in line with the community, is that I think a skateboard switch is still just going to be a stronger option than Dawn Wings Balloon because you get to Stellar Wish. And Stellar Wish is just so silly broken that it's just too important to not play. I think it's also worth noting that you do open up um, the option to have a higher retreat cost walling Pokemon. Again, I'll move back to things like Morpeko V. I do think Morpeko is going to be a strong archetype in the format, and there's a handful of two retreat cost uh, walls that you might want. Things like Zamazenta coming out in this set, Zerkatree, Keldeo, and even the Galarian Stumfisk. These are all options uh, that are now opened up to us now that they have a reduction of two retreat rather than one previously. So there are a few additional walls out there that become appealing. Um, but I think overall, if I ever see Air Balloon, it's going to be because of Dawn Wings and not many other times overall. But for me, um, I will always try and have Jirachi engines in this format, and I still think that they are going to outclass the need for Air Balloon overall. We move on to Fine Band, um, which is a tool that adds 10 more damage um, to your active Pokemon's attacks, which is really, really good. Uh, oh, sorry, just to your opponent's active Pokemon, of course. Um, it's half as good as Muscle Band, but let's not get this twisted. Muscle Band was a silly, silly strong card. And 10 damage is still 10 damage. This game is about maths and math fixing a lot of the time to make it work in your favor. And I think 10 damage is still potentially very, very relevant in our format. We've previously seen things like Reshiram and Charizard add in things like Shrine into their deck just so that Flare Strike can get over the line on Picarom. Now I can certainly foresee them having Goose Halla for Fine Band because they're already playing a Tag Call Engine if they are a Greens-based Reshizard. So that's a nice upgrade there. You don't have to start damaging yourself with Shrine. Um, I can certainly foresee it going into ADP builds of Zacian. Thanks to Ultra Creation, Zacian's attack goes up to 260 base damage. A Fine Band then takes you to 270, which is enough to knock out a decent chunk of Tag Team Pokemon, which is really, really strong. Uh, Reshiram and Zekrom GX, although not really a strong archetype in itself right now, 
maybe getting a fresh coat of paint in the new sets and fine band finally means it can hit 280 which is enough to deal with adp as well so fine band is going to be a fantastic math fixer for us and i think Really hats off to Guzma Halla. It means that we can play a low count of this and still have great access to the card when the need does arise for it as well. So I only give it a three star. I can see it squeezing into all sorts of different archetypes um, just to fix that math. Sometimes 10 is just enough. The reason why I'm not putting this much higher is because we do have other options that can also do that 10 damage. Like I said, Reshizard previously had Shrine. They can still use a Shrine if they want to. There's also a... Galarian Zigzagoon coming out in this set that can come into play and place a damage counter somewhere as well. So Fine Band isn't the only option that we have, but I think it might be one of the strongest ones because we do have great access to the card via Tag Call, via Guzhala. So I think that's going to be a big deal for Fine Band. Get it when you want it and change the, the math in your favor. I really do think it's going to be a nice addition to the deck, or well, to many decks. Also, Giant Charm is a great tool. I think for the same reasons... Guzmahala makes this accessible, and I think tanking is certainly viable in this format. It adds 30 hit points to the Pokemon this is attached to. I think this is a really big deal. Again, ADP Zacian. I can see this archetype being a really big deal, and them going to 260 and 270 with their damage modifiers, getting out of range of that is going to be really important for tag team decks. We've seen Choice Helmet be used in ADP. Um, and a few other greens based decks at times, like Guardians used it, sometimes Reshizard again has used this card. I can actually foresee Mewtwo trying to work in Giant Charm now, so that they can stay out of range from Azacian with um, that damage modifier in there. I can also see many of the VMAX decks uh, that just want to tank even more, try and opt to have the Giant Charm. Now the Snorlax does have the option for um, buff padding, but the Stone Journey only has a 3 retreat cost, so a Giant Charm would be the best option there. I also think ADP will want to go towards Giant Charm themselves, uh, because Choice Helmet is much more niche now. It's a reduction of 30, which is better than gaining 30 hit points, but that reduction is more situational. Giant Charm is a universal plus 30 against everything, and that's a really big deal. It forces an extra energy, for example, against non-GX Placephalon, and it's going to be useful against all these V and V Max Pokemon as well. And that's a really big deal because the Choice Helmet doesn't cover for those. So Choice Helmet is going to get way worse and worse as the Sword and Shield sets go on. Giant Charm stays exactly the same throughout the entire existence. So I'm rating this a four star. I can foresee many tag team decks using this. I think more so than the Fine Band because Fine Band has competitors. It has Shrine and it has... Um, Zigzagoon to compete with. Giant Charm has basically no competition. So if you're looking for health buff, this is the tool that you go for. That's why I'm giving it the slightly higher rating because it will end up seeing more play and more decks overall. And I think, um, again, just like I was saying with the fine band, the game is all about math at the end of the day. And this is a great math fixer to keep you alive for one turn. And keeping a three prizer alive for one turn is really going to change the outcome of games for a lot of different decks for sure. Lucky Egg is another tool that I think is absolutely phenomenal for a handful of archetypes. It says that if the Pokemon this card is attached to is knocked out by an attack from your opponent's active, draw cards until you have seven in hand. It's a fantastic tool-based means of reset stamp proofing yourself. That's why I've got all these other stage ones in the bottom corner. It's basically competition for these. Um, you can try and have a nice stage one draw engine for lots of Pokemon that normally takes up a lot of um, bench space, deck space, ball search spaces in your deck as well. Uh, or you could just say, why don't I? Why don't I just play Lucky Eggs instead and protect myself around Reset Stamp that way? Um, because I really do think this is a phenomenal tool for that. I think there will certainly be some archetypes looking towards this. Things like the Sableye Goons deck. They don't really have space on their board or space in their deck even to fit much or, well, many sort of stage one ability Pokemon that can draw them cards, potentially like a Ditto Zeb Striker in there or something like that. But I think Lucky Egg might be the best way to go here because oftentimes they're combo reliant in order to finish off the game. They need to set up damage on the opponent's stuff in order to reach a good damage output in order to finish off the active, right? So using Lucky Egg means that you still have a good chance of drawing back into that final like Rare Candy Obstagoon combo to take a knockout on the opponent's active. So I think Lucky Egg's really important for decks that don't have space for other draw engine style Pokemon or just need that extra bit of help. Again, looking at things like Steelix, the Thwomp deck, 
uh, where it has a silly modifier of 50 for each Pokemon with a four retreat cost that you discard from hand. Having Lucky Eggs makes that way, way less of a meme. It gives you a good chance of getting into other three CEs, into other like welder combos, and of course getting you into a bunch of four retreat cost Pokemon or Lure Balls in order to finish off the game and do ridiculous damage output. More realistically away from the Steelix is probably the Baby Blacephalon, right? I think this is where Lucky Egg is going to be absolutely insane. We've seen Green Blounds do very well actually just this last weekend over in the Bochum Regionals. Uh, Blacephalon, well, both Baby Blacephalon builds were in the finals of that tournament. And I think a Green Space Blounds will absolutely adore having Lucky Egg in their list uh, because it's the biggest downside of this archetype. You take a big three prize knockout, you get reset stamped and you can sometimes just lose instantly. Lucky Egg is going to really safeguard you around that. Even if your opponent tries to gust around your Blacephalon that has the Lucky Egg on and take a knockout elsewhere, you've kept a Blacephalon with three energies on it, and that's half of your combo already done, so the reset stamp is even then going to be less effective. So overall, that's nuts. We have really poor means of removing tools right now. We have um, Faba, and we have um, Labs as our best means of doing so. And that's just not all that strong. Not many decks want to be playing those sorts of cards. So Lucky Egg is going to be incredible for Baby Blounds. I think the Green's Baby Blounds gets way, way stronger. I also think all Welder decks in general can really benefit from this. Because as we've seen with Ability Zard, especially before they put Zeb Striker in their list as a ditto sort of evolution option, many times the biggest reason why um, Ability Zard sort of flops, you know, either they miss Welders in the early game and they have a really slow start, or... They get reset stamped after their early turns, and they're not able to get back into things like Victini Prism Star and Welder to close out games. Now you have that Lucky Egg, you get into a fresh seven cards, and that's giving you, you know, on top of like Stellar Wishes and stuff, a really good opportunity to close out games. That's why I'm rating this so high. I think it's going to be fantastic for Welder decks, fantastic for Baby Blacephalon in particular, but also could see play in other archetypes such as that Sableye V deck and other Mimi decks out there as well. If you want to try some Steelix action, I'll probably be streaming it at some point. Lumberry is a reprint from, what is that, EX Emerald, I think. At the end of any turn, if the Pokemon this card is attached to is affected by a special condition, remove all of them, well, any special conditions, remove all of them and discard this card. Now, special conditions aren't really rife in the format right now. Uh, even if there were, we have a Skateboard, we have Switch. There's even a Galarian Rapidash in this set, which I think will be stronger than Lumberry. Unfortunately, we have a, such a good amount of tools right now in the format. We have this new Fine Band, we have the new Giant Charm, we have Lucky Egg. All of these are far, far more impactful than Lumberry ever will be. And like I said, status conditions aren't all that important right now. So I'm going to give this the one star. It's outclassed by just regular Switch effects overall. Citrus Berry, kind of a similar story. This is a basically a tool version of a potion. Uh, at the end of each player's turn, if the Pokemon this card is attached to has at least three damage counters on it, heal 30 damage from it, then discard this card. Why is it better than a potion in theory? Well, it's because you can sort of secure it on something earlier, and if you're getting reset stamped, you still get that heal later on. That could actually be important for specifically things like the Tina Chomp matchup, where they try and blow up their Miss Magiuses and um, hit you for like a 40 poke and then stamp you on the same turn. Then you've got to try and find instant answers, otherwise they're going to Calamitous slash you for a bunch of damage. Now, rather than having a potion effect, you can Citrus Berry on like turn one before they stamp you, and you can try and get that heal off of early damage um, so that they're not just staring down a big clamp to slash the future turn. So there is small benefits to this over potion, but again, same thing with a Lumberry. It competes with some much, much better tools in the format right now, unfortunately. So going to give it that one star. There's only one special energy in this set, but it is a doozy, Aurora Energy forces you to discard a card from hand in order to play this, but it provides every energy type, um, but only one at a time. So it's essentially a rainbow energy, but rather than taking one damage on the Pokemon you attach it to, you have to discard a card. Now, I've already mentioned a bunch of times, discard energy is everywhere for Mewtwo. It's going to love having Aurora energy. Um, not putting that one damage counter on yourself can sometimes be such a great deal against Zacian specifically. Going down to 260 against ADP Zacians is horrible. Also very horrible against um, Giratina in Malamar based decks. So keeping it a nice 270 is a really big deal for you. Um, and having discard synergy everywhere now with Quick Ball and Aurora Energy and your Tag Call stuff. You have plenty of means of bidding cards from your hand to get rid of those Pokemon uh, nice and early, so Perfection is live. It's going to be fantastic. 
I also think it's good for Guzma and Haller. Um, obviously, just because we have great access to this card, I can see it going into ADP. It gives you that discard synergy of metal energies, the basic metals, so that uh, Zacian has plenty of options with Metal Saucer. Um, I can also see it going into uh, to Giratina Garchomp. Discard synergy is really good to make Miss Magius draw you more cards. If you're trying to dig out combo pieces like reset stamps um, or just more draw power in general. So I think it's good for all three of these tag teams. I foresee all three of these tag teams to still be strong contenders. I can also see this Aurora energy going into things like Picarom even if they're going to adopt a tag team engine at some point. And that gives them discard synergy for lightning energies for their Coco Prism Star as well. So Aurora energy all around, fantastic card. I can see it going into all sorts of different decks. Five stars from me. We move on to the Pokemon at last, and we will start off with the Grass types. Celebi V is going to be the first on our list. Um, ultimately, I don't see this card being all that strong, N neither does the community. It has two attacks, the first of which is Find a Friend. Search your deck for up to two Pokemon, reveal them, and put them into your hand. Very slow to search for Pokemon and put them into your hand, especially when there's things like um, Rowlet, uh, Alone Executor, that can instantly evolve you into a Stage 2 in the Grass type archetypes. Um, which is way, way better than finding friends, and obviously you're not putting stuff onto board instantly, so that's overall very, very slow from the Celebi V. It also has Line Force for a grass color, so you do 50 plus 20 more for each of your benched Pokemon. Not all that strong, again, 150 isn't fantastic for two energies, your 180 hit points as well, so you're very fragile. I don't really foresee this going into things like Rillaboom, even as a one-of, I don't foresee it being a strong enough card. Uh, bead could be a way of accelerating this, but overall I don't foresee it being fantastic. I think possibly the only home I see this is really just having a V Pokemon in Tangrowth, um, just because you might face down certain archetypes that aren't really affected by um, Grass Knot. If you're up against evolution style decks that get around your Absols and such, if you just happen to be up against attackers here and there that don't get affected by that free, like if they're able to free retreat around you or something, if they're using Zero Aura. Things like that could be really annoying. Having a Celebi V to still get through things and have a decent baseline of damage on its own end could be worth the space. But Tangrowth is a pretty rogue deck. Celebi V probably not even that great in that deck. So I'm going to give it that one star overall. Delmise V is slightly more promising. It's a lot tankier at 220 hit points for a basic two prizer. That's very good. It comes with uh, three attacks. Oh no, it comes with two attacks, sorry. Uh, Wrath of Wraths does 30, and if any of your grass Pokemon were knocked out by damage from an opponent's attack during their last turn, you do 90 more damage. So 120 for one as a revenge style attack, only when grass Pokemon get knocked out, but that's still a decent number. I think it's relatively um, efficient. I think going from 120 into 200 with Giga Hammer is also pretty reasonable uh, a lot of the time. Uh, Giga Hammer for two Grass and the Colors is 200, and you can't use Giga Hammer during your next turn. So you're likely having to use things like Air Balloon, Dorm Wings, stuff like that, in order to reuse your Delmise if you really need to. So it's not quite perfect. It's a little bit frustrating to try and use this card. And the damage output isn't necessarily stellar. 200 is good enough to knock out some basic V Pokemon. It's obviously enough to deal with Dedenne and a lot of old basic GXs. But... It's nowhere near knocking out, you know, tag teams or anything like that. There's no modifiers that we can use in the Grass Archetype that can make that way stronger. Um, so I think it's settling for two shots against tag teams, and overall that's not very efficient. To try and accelerate this, possibly the new Rillaboom from the set that we'll get onto later. Possibly the Delmise comes in a one-of in the sort of Egg Rail Rillaboom deck. Because you can make this guy kind of tanky with uh, things like the Lee Vanny, the Stage 2. But overall, I do think this will be quite slow and not fantastic overall. It could be Raoegg's um, Keldeo answer. That might be the only reason why the C is play, really. So I'm going to give it a two-star. But overall, um, I can see it being very niche overall. I do like its revenge-style attack, but it's only when grass stuff gets knocked out. And there aren't very many relevant grass decks out there right now. All Beetle is an interesting stage two. It has the ability Bug Radar. Once during a turn, you may look at the top three cards of your opponent's deck and then put them back in any order. This is a much stronger ability than the effect of a Chip Chip Ice Axe because you get to rearrange all three cards, whereas Chip Chip only selects one and then the cards beneath the one you selected are all random. All Beetle means that you can see all three of those cards and really react appropriately. You can put, for example, if they have one bad card in the top three, 
uh, and the other two are very strong. You know, if you're a controlling deck, you can let them draw for turn, and then immediately you will Bell Elba away the two good ones that you saw, and then you can use Bug Radar the following turn to reset that process. If they have, for example, two bad cards in those top three, I say bad cards, I mean cards that won't make you lose the game as Pidgeotto Control, basically, um, when they're down to like two prizes left or something, and you've done the whole Jesse James Mars um, sort of surge combo. Um, when there's two bad cards, it means that you don't have to Bell Elba on that first, like on the next turn, you don't have to Bell Elba, you can use other things. So it gives you a little bit more safety than a Chip Chip. It also means that your resource management becomes a lot cleaner because you don't have to keep recovering Chip Chip. You can get all sorts of other pieces back instead. And it means that potentially your loop of um, destroying your opponent's deck is much faster and much more fluid because you don't need to get the Chip Chip back. You can get more defensive pieces like Crushing Hammers and Custom Catchers way faster in your cycle whilst you're also Bell Elbering away their stuff. So the ability is far stronger than Chip Chip. But the reason why I'm giving this a one star is the spaces that it takes up. You don't ever really want to play more than a 101 line or a 111 line of this card um, because of space. Chip Chip is only ever a two slot in Pidgeotto. Um, and really, that's just because you don't want to prize the one of. Um, but now you have a huge headache of prizing if you want to play a 111 or Beetle or the three cards that would be an or Beetle. And also, this is, of course, can be gusted and knocked out. And if it does get knocked out, then you're never going to be able to perfect lock people like you would with a Chip Chip. So it is essentially far weaker in Pidgeotto Control. A potential second option for this card is actually in a Breakzard. Um, previously, well, when Breakzard first came out, it was sort of theorized that we could try and make an Omega lock where you have the Surge combo and Chip Chips in the Charizard deck in order to make them brick. Um but that never really came to fruition. However, something that we have seen in other Greens decks is using a 101 Omastar. And I think in a similar light, Breakzard could use a 101 or Beetle um, to allow them to have that sort of perfect lock on people where you do destruct your opponent's hand with a combination of Surge, Stamp, Mars, Jesse James. You've got an or Beetle already on board and you're ruining their top decks so you can just start brilliant flaring through them. I think it's obviously probably a little bit worse than Omastar, but it does allow that sort of option to come into play for Breakzard. I think ultimately worse than Chip Chip in terms of the amount of space it takes up, and it's weak to being gusted. By the way, its attack is pretty rubbish. It does 90 and 30 more for each psychic energy attached to this guy. It's a stage 2 that you don't want to commit to energy-wise, so it's really the ability that matters here. And I think ultimately the Chip Chip, although a weaker effect, um, takes up less deck spaces, and that's why it's going to overall just be the stronger option. Rillaboom is another interesting stage too. Uh, once during your turn, you may search your deck for up to two grass energy and attach them to one of your Pokemon. It is really excellent to attach energies from deck. You're thinning the deck for you. You only need to get the Rillaboom into play for your entire strategy to be online immediately. And it's great acceleration overall. Um, obviously, the more Rillaboom you get into play, this could be even more aggressive. If you get the double boom going, you're really getting a bunch of energies into, feel, into the field every single turn. It is essentially a spiritual successor of Vikavolt that gave you a combination of Grass and Lightning. Now, only getting two Grass does limit us in terms of the attackers that are available, but it means that we get to play a solid color of basic energies, which means we have a lot less headache of when our initial few energies start getting off the field, we'll still probably have a good amount in our deck left in order to keep using Voltage Beat uh, throughout the rest of the game. So I think that's really awesome for us. His attack isn't really usable, uh, but it can knock out other non-GX one prize of stuff if you really need it to. I think the biggest reason why Rillaboom is just a two-star for me is the receivers of this energy. I really don't think there are that many good ones out there. Um, Rowlet and Exi Alolan Eggs obviously can get your Rillaboom into play very easily with Super Growth, but Calming Hurricane and Tropical Hour aren't that high damage output. Venusaur and Snivy has some good um, gusting ability, but again, Forest Dump and Solar Plant GX don't hit the heights. And I think Rayquaza GX, although Dragon Break can get to really high numbers, uh, especially in combination with Voltage Beat and Stormy Winds all working together, I do think that it's very fragile these days. Being a 180 hit points, two prize Pokemon is very fragile and hit points are just starting to go higher and higher and that just forces you to have even more energies around your guys. I really think we would need something like, um, what's it called? The, 
Oh man, it's the tool that gives you energies back. Wishful Baton. Yeah, it felt like Rayquaza would need like Wishful Baton in the format for a Rayquaza Rilla Room deck to actually see play. I really don't think it's going to work out. So just a two star right now. We're just waiting for a good uh, V Grass Basic or a V Max Grass Pokemon that can really break Rilla Boom wide open. Speaking of V Pokemon, I'm also going to be talking about the promo Vs that we're getting. Um, it's the starter V evolutions, basically. Um, starting with this Rillaboom, it is, of course, a basic. It has 220 hit points. It has two attacks. Forest Feast allows you to grab two grass basics from your deck and instantly put them on the bench. That can be a pretty handy option to get you into some stuff early on, but it's still pretty slow, and we have great ball search in the format already, especially the grass stuff. They already have netball available, so Forest Feast shouldn't be all that difficult for you. Well, it shouldn't be all that helpful for you because you'll already have a bunch of basics down or have access to those basics. And then it has Wood Hammer for three grass and a colorless, which is pretty expensive. You do 220, and this Pokemon also does 30 to itself. Self damaging, obviously a bit of a pet peeve. You never really want to be doing that. You're doing um, the work for your opponent, which isn't great. And again, 220 isn't really a good break point of damage a lot of the time. You're still two shotting tag teams, you're two shotting um, V Max Pokemon. You are starting to one-shot most basic Vs at this point. I think almost every basic V, unless it's um, ones that have like frying pans and charms and stuff on them. So Woodhammer is good in that respect. Slightly better than the um, Delmize V in terms of damage. But four energy is a lot. It means you would have had to have turned one attached to this guy and turned two attached as well as get a voltage beat up in order to even use Woodhammer. And again, when you start to damage yourself, things start to look bad. You're still a grass Pokemon. And a two-prizer at that, and fire isn't going anywhere. Well, there is still a good card in this format, it turns out. So I think overall Rillaboom V is outclassed by the things that we already have in format. That being Raweg, and also Buzzmosa seems to be more impressive overall. There's just more going on with Buzzmosa. Even though those two are three-prizers and Rillaboom's a two-prizer, I really don't see enough from the Rillaboom um, that makes me think it's worth putting into uh, regular Rillaboom decks. On to the fire stuff now, and we kick off with Cinderace. It has the ability Libero. Once during a turn, when this Pokemon moves from your bench to your active, you may attach up to two fire energy from your discard pile to it. An absolutely phenomenal ability. It's a self-powering up stage two. All you need to worry about is getting the physical Pokemon into play and have a manual attachment for turn. That's super easy for fire decks uh, because you have fire crystal available. Um, you have giant hearth available. We have Rosa for evolution decks as well that can get you your physical attachment for turn. So Flare Striker is very easy to set up and it's a nice 190 damage that discards two from this guy. Really not bad either. Um, 190 is very good. It's enough to deal with Dedenne. It's enough to deal with a lot of these basic GX Pokemon. Not quite enough to deal with V Pokemon, uh, which is a little bit frustrating, but you're still two-shotting tag teams and V Maxes. Not bad at all for a one-prizer, uh, which is pretty nice, especially because you're hitting a good type right now. Zacian V, one of the strongest new cards coming out from the set, will be in a lot of different decks. Um, not just ones that want to attack with Zacian, but Zacian could end up in all sorts of archetypes just for when you go first. Um, you search out a Zacian and get a draw three at the end of your turn. So Cinderace being able to gust that up and flare strike crit for two prizes seems very reasonable for sure. I think there are a few di uh, directions for Cinderace. I can certainly foresee it going into a Chandler. It's some guaranteed damage, which is great for you. Chandler never really works with guaranteed damage. You're just hoping for the best of Spirit Burner. Uh, but like we've seen Charizard previously going to Chandler, Cinderace could end up being a one or two of in Chandler just to be additional options for attacking, because Libero has great synergy with Spirit Burner. You're naturally discarding a bunch of resources from the top of your deck. Cinderace does well when there are energies in your discard pile. He can steal them for himself and use Flare Striker for some guaranteed damage output to really ease your worries. I think Chandler gets a few new pieces from this set. Inteleon can be a nice Pokemon that can just be fuel for Spirit Burner damage, but also can help get a bunch of Pokemon uh, out via getting those items, which is great. Uh, so Cinderace could certainly go into the new age builds of Chandler. Um, also, I could foresee Cinderace being like a 101 or a thin line in actual just non-GX Charizard. There are those turns where you just want to Roaring Resolve and build up big damage with uh, with Continuous Blaze Ball. Um, so you can go ahead and start building up damage on the bench, but you still want something to do for your turn. You can just go ahead and use Libero and Flare Striker instead. So again, 
it's because it's so good at self recharging it's a really good option even if it's not the main man it could see play in charizard the baby version or chandler as well just being a bit part player i'm sure people will try and build this as well as its own like four of cinderace and you're just going for a heavy jirachi switch count because it has great synergy with libero you have a high rose account and all that good stuff I think the only issue with that compared to these other non-GX fire decks is these other non-GX fire decks just have better damage caps. They reach silly numbers, so they can take sometimes one-shots on tag teams and even uh, V-Maxes in the case of the Charizard. It can go absolutely insane. So I think Cinderace is probably better as a bit part player than a uh, full-on Cinderace deck, but I'm sure people will try it once again because it's going to be easy to chain. It has a nice 170 hit point, so it doesn't instantly lose to Malamar just because of like spell tag math most of the time just probably has to go straight onto the cinderace so they're wasting a lot of their free damage counters um so a lot of the time this could see pretty reasonable amounts of play but i don't think it'll ever be pretty top tier cinderace v similar to the rillaboom v isn't that impressive and spoilers neither is the inteleon <laughs> um 210 hit points on the basic again pretty good as a two prize pokemon field runner is the ability if there's a stadium uh, this pokemon has no retreat cost that's very good obviously fire decks want to always have stadiums in play be it the heat factory or your giant hearths uh, so naturally that ability will be live a good amount of times and it has the crimson legs attack for two fire and a colorless you do 140 it's enough to deal with a lot of one prizes um, which is decent but the biggest issue here is that you're just worse than heatran in most cases yes you have 20 more hit points but Heatran can steal energy for himself on all sorts of other targets. And he has the option to hot burn GX things, which is just so important for decks. So if Cinderace was ever going to be like a one of in archetypes, unfortunately, it gets outclassed by Heatran in almost every regard. So I think as long as Heatran's around, there's no real need for the Cinderace to be thought of in fire decks. We move on to Torkoal V now. It's a card that I actually really do like. I was between three and four stars for this card, believe it or not. I do think it has a lot going for it. It's a two t uh, 210 hit point basic V Pokemon that has two attacks. The first is Flame Pillar for two fire and a colorless. You do 90, and if you dis well, you discard the top card of your deck. If the card you discarded is a fire energy, you do 90 more damage. Now, obviously, this is just a welder away. So potentially going second on turn one, you could be churning out 180 damage. That's great pressure against a lot of things. You're starting to pepper up tag teams you're starting to do a good number on v and v max pokemon as well and of course you can gust up the denes and just knock them out pretty easily now it's not, never guaranteed to discard the top card of your deck and it just happened to be a fire energy but we do gain some great cards in this set that can make that happen a lot more consistently the orangaroo is one of my favorite cards of the set for sure it allows you to swap a card from your hand from the top card of your deck so if you use orangaroo and put a fire that's in your hand on top of your deck, you can guarantee that Flame Pillar is doing 180, which is very good for you. Also, I can oftentimes see a Magcargo deck sort of piecing together in my mind here, Torkoal V being an option in that deck, as like a one or two of, um, just for some more early tempo against people, which is great. Uh, you can also try and use Smooth Over if you have to, to put a Fire Energy on the top, and then just discard that. So you have the Orangaroo and the Magcargo that can do that for you. You're just a welder away from doing 180. Also, what I think is really cool is it has that Steam Crash attack. For three Fire and a Colorless, you do 120 and discard two energy from your opponent's active Pokemon. Now, it's not high damage, and Fire decks are used to doing crazy numbers all this time, but discarding two energy is very influential against ADP, um, because oftentimes they will try and use their GX attack and then move into Ultimate Ray. Now, you can Steam Crash and get rid of those energies and uh, make it so it's impossible for them to Ultimate Ray. Now, Obviously, regular Reshizards, they'll try and just go over the top of an ADP. They'll try and um, double blaze through them, right? Um, but here's the deal. Now we can't Welder going first on turn one. So a lot of the time we'll have to settle for four energy being the maximum amount, i.e. turn one, attach a Torkoal, turn two, attach a Torkoal, Welder to Torkoal. So unfortunately, thanks to the rule changes, Welder... You pretty much have to accept that sometimes Flare Strike and, Flare and Steam Crash now are the best turn two options that you have available for you. So uh, having this more defensive Torkoal seems to be a decent option against ADP. Obviously, both Flame Pillar and Steam Crash are enough to deal with Zacian, a very, very important card going into the new meta. So I think Torkoal certainly does warrant a place in a sort of semi-rogue Magcargo deck. 
and also could see a lot of play in updated builds of ability zard even if it is just a one of it'll certainly be a decent one of for sure discarding energy from your opponent isn't just good against adp of course it's good against you know like mirror matches good against mewtwo good against all this other stuff so torkoal a pretty nice high hit point v pokemon that can be pesky decent damage output enough to deal with the denes with its first attack and then steam crashing your way through some stuff trying to build up a huge amount of damage well energy i should say um, and just removing those is sometimes just really helpful for you. So yeah, I need with the three star. I can see it going into a couple of these fire based decks because Welder is still going to be strong. Speaking of Welder, we have one more fire type here, Victini V. It's another basic that has 190 hit points and it comes with two attacks. Spreading Flames for a colorless allows you to attach up to three fire energy from your discard pile to your Pokemon in any way that you like. I think this should not be undersold because this attack is really, really good. Um, how often have you been frustrated as a welder based deck that you've not that you just miss welder right if you're Mewtwo if you're Reshizard you miss welder you feel like you've lost the game a lot of the time I remember early on in builds of Reshizard I even played a um, Heatran the non-GX Heatran in my deck for when I went second I had the option to get more energies into play Victini V is very similar obviously these welder based decks have great synergy with the Dene they are often always playing high counts um, and high ball search counts to try and get that going so and also they have a really high natural count of energies so having that early synergy with victini v can be fantastic if you just happen to start with this card or if you started jirachi you can easily move into this victini v and spreading flames to start powering up a reshizard or a mewtwo mew on the bench which is great and it also has the energy burst attack which is very reminiscent to gardevoir's gx attack well gardevoir gx's attack i should say um, energy burst has 30 times the amount of energy attached to both active Pokemon. Previously, that effect was on a stage two. Yes, Gardevoir GX cheated with its own secret spring and it had, you know, uh, three CE and DC available. But Victini V, it has Welder available to it and it's a basic. So that's really, really good potential damage output. Again, being a red card is very good. You can knock out Zacians very easily. And this could finally be a nice answer to Keldeo. Uh, for Mewtwo Mew uh, and that's something that Mewtwo Mew has really been lacking and having these V Pokemon could be a godsend so I think the fact that this is decent as a turn one option if you just whiff Welder you can still get good acceleration going and Energy Burst being a nice type coverage option for Mewtwo specifically um, and also just being decent numbers when your opponent starts going over the top with energy attachments so I think this is an excellent card I'm giving it a four star because I believe it could easily go into Mewtwo and probably will um, and could be seen in some abilities are decks also. We move on to the water stuff now, starting off with Ice QV. Um, it is a 210 hit point V Pokemon. Man, hit points are starting to get absolutely crazy for basics. It has the ability Cold Absorption. Whenever you attach a water energy from your hand to this Pokemon during your turn, uh, heal 30 damage from this Pokemon. Now, that's decent. Getting free potions <laughs> from attaching is never too bad. Um, but it's not that tanky in the first place, unfortunately. And it does have Blizzard for two water and a color to do 120 and 10 to each of your opponent's bench Pokemon. There is minor synergy with spreading to the bench with water stuff. We've seen Volcanium Prism Star use Sauna Blast and put damage on the opponent's bench. There's also, of course, Magikarp Warlord. Let's not forget that GX attack that gets a big spread of damage onto the opponent's bench as well. So Ice U does have some minor synergy with putting bench damage on stuff. You could potentially see it in things like the new Frostmoth deck or Quagnag decks that could be coming back now that we have better ball search. But overall, these, car these damages aren't that stellar, and its ability is just a minor effect, really. It's never going to keep you out of two-shot range, unfortunately. So I think this is just go overall just not going to see play, even in the water synergistic stuff. We move on to Frostmoth, and this might be the first surprise in store for you guys. I'm rating Frostmoth a three-star card. The community are determined that this is an excellent card, many of them giving it a five-star a handful giving it four, so only 8% of people agree with me on the rating here. Let's talk through Frostmoth. I do think it's an amazing card and it will see play, but I don't think it's going to be the face of a top tier deck. Ice Dance, as often as you like during your turn, you may attach a water energy from your hand to one of your water Pokemon, your benched water Pokemon. Um, so it is Rain Dance, um, but 
it's only to the bench. It's a small downside. It's a small price to pay compared to being a stage two. This is, I think, the first time ever we've had Rain Dance on a stage one. And that is truly incredible. Aurora Beam is an attack, but it only does 30. So it's all about the ability here. A stage one that can Rain Dance. Amazing acceleration. No doubt that's going to be a phenomenal um, ability. And in future, I think this is going to be crazy good. I can foresee it living up to the five-star hype eventually. Right now in the format, we are limited to a handful of options, and I personally don't think those options are strong enough. Um, we've got Blastoise Piplup as a potential tag team. We've got Volcanium Prism, which is an excellent card in a vacuum and would go in the Frostmoth style decks, but I think the biggest downside here is that Keldeo GX is getting far, far weaker. There are plenty of V Pokemon coming in that can easily hit 170 and get around that pure heart ability, so it's far less disruptive than it used to be. And then we come to the Keldeo V and the Lapras V Max. They're both weak to Lightning, which is a big issue because I rate more Peko and I think that Pika Rom is coming back in a good way. So I think their tanking ability, well, especially Lapras's tanking ability isn't all that useful. Um, I think that's a big issue for the card. Um, and unfortunately, I think they are really expensive attack costs. Um, Lapras for three energy just does 180. You can keep stacking more and more on, which is potentially very good. But I think overall it's quite costly to try and do this. I think it costs a lot in terms of how many deck spaces you commit to putting water energies in. Um, and you need to start playing cards like Fisherman, Misty Lorelei, Energy Retrieval. All of these cards are pretty awkward. And that's in a deck where you're already playing multiple stage ones. And I also think that the meta might be going towards Marnie meta, where you're forced to a four card hand size. And that's just not going to cut it when you're trying to get two stage ones and like five energy in your hand instantly. I think that's going to be really, really rough. So I think Frostmoth will ultimately be the face of an archetype for certain, but I think that archetype will end up being uh, below the bar. I think it's going to end up being a below tier one, below tier two deck even. Even though its type coverage is good, hitting for fire stuff is great. Um, I think the majority of the format is not going to be too fussed by Frostmoth. I think it's ultimately, even as a stage one, going to be too clunky and slow, which is pretty remarkable overall. I will give Frostmoth some bonus points, though, with um, Quagsire, uh, because you can only attach to the bench. Quagsire can instantly wash them out to the active if you want to. I think the biggest reason why I would want to do this, however, is if you want to wash out onto non-water Pokemon. Frostmoth can only attach to water stuff, Quagsire lets you wash it out onto other things. So the Quagsire could be used if you want to tech out your deck with some colorless attackers. Some uh, options then open up for this and you might have some better attackers available to you because right now I'm not all that impressed by the stuff we've got. Let's move on to Inteleon. It's a really interesting uh, stage two. I think they did very well with the starters. They're all uh, one prizes that have great abilities available to them. Um, we'll start off with the Drizzile actually. It's a stage one 90 hit point Pokemon that has the ability Shady Business. Uh, when you play this Pokemon from hand to evolve during your turn, you may search your deck for one trainer, reveal it and put it into your hand, then shuffle your deck. It's a great ability. It really is fantastic, and it's one of the reasons why I believe Inteleon will see a decent amount of play. It's a great stepping stone to have this. It means you're not forced into a rare candy of Inteleon. You can try and use this Drizzile to go ahead and get you any trainer card. Now, this is trainer, which means it can also get you supporter cards. It can get you stadiums. It's a very, very versatile card. Essentially, it's a Skylar effect in an ability. And on a stage one, that ain't too shabby at all. If you're already going to be a deck that plays rare candies and evolutions, I can certainly see Drizzile um, coming into play. Then we have this Inteleon. It has also got uh, Shady Dealings now, the ability. It's essentially the same as Drizzile, but instead of one trainer, you get two and put them straight into your hand. This can be amazing for getting you some combo pieces. It can get you custom catches, for example. It can get you reset stamp plus your best supporter for turn. It can get you all sorts of stuff going. It can get you more rare candies, more ball search for more um, Pokemon, which also sounds very interesting. I can certainly foresee this going into Meganium uh, Nido Queen style decks to help you fish out even more Pokemon. And it makes it very, like the chain reaction starts happening. When you start evolving into Drizziles, you get your Meganiums and your Nido Queens, and then Queen's Call gets you into more Drizziles and Inteleons, and then the Drizziles and Inteleons get you even more Nido Queens and Meganiums and stuff. So I can really see Nido Queen being a lot faster in this format because you have Drizzile and Inteleon getting you even more stuff out of the deck to keep the roll going, basically, which sounds really cool. I also saw a really interesting rogue from Japan that was a, like, ADP Zacian style thing where you had 
stage twos in your deck as well. You had Inteleon, you had Meganium, and you had Incineroar. And you had, like, Aurora Energy going on, so you could hit all sorts of different type coverages. When ADP buffs these Pokemon, Inteleon goes to 150, so it can knock out Reshizard with weakness. Incineroar... Oh, sorry, it's not ADP. It's just a... Um, it's just Zacian, right? The, it's the Incineroar doing the damage buff. This ADP here on the screen, it, this should be a Zacian, actually. Uh, the Incineroar has the damage buff, right? The strong cheer. So with Incineroar's own... Strong Cheer working on his own flamethrower. He can knock out Zacian uh, in one hit, which is really cool. And um, you even go up to hitting 280 on Grass Week stuff with Meganium with Super Boost. So I saw this really cool rogue, which was Zacian and all these stage twos. I want to try that out as well. I think ultimately Inteleon's ability is comparable to Alolan Ninetales GX. Mysterious Guidance was used for a decent amount of time and lost Thunder Meta. We kind of lost a lot of Ball Search and... Uh, Lowland Tails got a lot worse, but this is a single prizer that also has the Drizzile that can help you out as well in the sort of mid game. So, a lot less downside to the Inteleon outside of just being more deck space. Um, but I certainly see this card being great for evolution style decks, at least the, the Nido Queen deck. That's like guaranteed to be a Nido Queen. It could end up being in other things like Frost Moth decks, it could end up being even in like Sableye. Um, goons style decks just to help you get more stuff out into play so i think these are really cool uh, they give you good com synergy as well if you're a deck that just wants to play for quick ball for com and be like heavy on evolutions and stuff just giving your comms more live access and being able to pull them out with shady business and dealings earlier uh, also seems very good so yeah inteleon giving the three stars because it is at the end of the day still a lot of deck spaces but i want to test out this guy a lot i'm really hyped on his abilities i think they are really really good Inteleon V, I'm a lot less hyped on. Um, it's a 200 hit point basic V Pokemon. Snipe Shop does 1 for 40. Aqua Report does 3 for 130. Even with the acceleration Water has right now with the Moth and Quag Nag, I don't think this ever is better than Keldeo V, Keldeo GX, or even Blastoise Piplup. So I'm not going to waste much more time on this guy. Unfortunately, it's still very weak and is also weak to Lightning, and that's not very good for it either. Keldeo V, I'm going to give a 2 star. Um, I think does heart back to the old Keldeo EX with Secret Sword, now doing a 30 plus modifier rather than a 20 plus from the old EX era, uh, which is quite nice. It also has a nice one for 40 prod that you can do against stuff. But ultimately, I think this is probably weaker than Lapras VMAX. Um, there's potential to try and use this over Frostmoth, or sorry, over Lapras in Frostmoth, just because even though you're doing 40 less base damage, you're at least a basic Pokemon, and that gives you more deck space to have more physical water energies and more just consistency cards i think as i alluded to earlier talking about frostmoth lapras as an archetype i think they're going to be very fragile to uh, things like marnie uh, because you require so many physical energies in hand and you need to try and rain dance them all into play instantly and you need to be multiple stage ones well if you try and cut back that deck a little bit and just play frostmoth keldeo your damage output is a little bit less but you're probably going to get your strategy off that much more and that may end up being being the strongest option, or at least playing a one-of in the Keldeo and just have like a 2-2 Lapras VMAX, trying to get that into play just sort of in the late game, whereas Keldeo is sort of fighting that early fight and is a one-of in Frostmoth. That's really how I foresee this card. Um, it could end up going into ADP builds that are still heavily water-focused with Keldeo. That's only really going to be good if Picarom and Mewtwo and ADP are still like the best decks in format and Keldeo is still like annoying with its ability. Ultimately, I don't really foresee that being the case, uh, so I really see ADP going more towards the metal style, uh, with Zacian being the best option. So overall, Keldeo doesn't seem all that strong. Maybe an, op an optional one of in Frostmoth. That leads me to the three-star rating of Lapras V and V Max. You'll notice there are two pie charts here. Um, the first pie chart on the uh, on the left here, that one is for the V, and this one is for the V Max. Um, but basically, they will always be hand in hand. I don't think you'll ever play the Lapras V on its own. Um, 210 for three and a colorless doesn't sound that good, especially when you're putting energies back into your hand. Again, you might just play a Lapras V deck without the VMAX or just play one copy of VMAX in the Frostmoth deck uh, just so you can at least do some decent damage with Ocean Loop. But again, 210 isn't all that good, especially for four energies. Not really impressing me all that much. Wave back for a colorless allows you to attach one from hand to this guy and switch to the bench. I actually think that's a really good effect. Getting Lapras to the bench is a big priority because then you can start spamming energies on it with Frostmoth. 
Um, and also you can push some things into the active, possibly a doll, possibly like a Jirachi or something like that, or just like a one prizer, like a Snom, um, if you have multiples set up. So that's a really reasonable opening attack. I think it's very good for you. Ocean Loop does decent damage. It gets through um, a bunch of basic V Pokemon and all that good stuff. The Lapras VMAX, 320 hit points is very big and tanky. Unfortunately, Lightning Weakness is going to be an issue for me here. Uh, when Picarom and Morpeko do seem like decent archetypes. G-Max Pump does 90 and 30 more for each water energy attached to this guy. So uh, it is 180 for 3, which is relatively efficient. Uh, and as you stack that up, it does get into more damage. But ultimately, unless you have a crazy turn where... Really, I can foresee the Lapras taking like a two-shot with G-Max Pump and tanking. And then you use like a Fisherman or a Misty Lorelei to get those extra like four or five energies that you just stack on all at once with the Moth to do a crazy bit of damage in the late game. But ultimately it requires like a really big setup uh, enable like to be able to pull this off. And I'm not sure if it's going to work out okay. Um, like I said, I, ju I just think the deck is going to be chock full of water energies. You're playing multiple stage ones and a lot of spaces get eaten up by this sort of strategy. I think you're going to be quite weak to Marnie overall. And I think it's going to be a little bit below the bar, mainly because of its type weakness as well. So I think you're going to be weak to a popular supporter in the format and two probably popular archetypes in the format, which just doesn't spell good news for this archetype overall, which is a shame because when I initially saw Lapras, I was pretty hyped on the card and I thought it was going to be excellent. Um, I do think that its weakness is a big reason why it probably won't hit the heights that many people are expecting because as you can see, at least for the VMAX, more people are pretty hyped on this uh, than I am. Uh, but I'm keeping my um, head to the, well, my feet on the ground on this one. I'm not getting too hyped by the Moth. Um, I think there's too many things going against the Lapras right now. We're just in the waiting room for better attackers, really, in my opinion, for the water stuff. Sea King's the last water guy we'll get onto, giving it a nice one star. But still worth noting, uh, the Horn Shred attack for one water flips three coins for each head's discard an energy from your opponent's active Pokemon. This obviously isn't the light, uh, lighting the world on fire or whatever, but it could be an optional one-off in Pidgeotto Control. You're already playing Water Energies. Um, you already played Ditto Prism Star. Why not play a Sea King to give yourself potentially extra quote-unquote crushing hammers to just be extra discard from your opponent? Oftentimes we've seen Articuno and Misty Lorelei go hand-in-hand in, hand in Bird Control um, just because of how important it is to cold crush your opponent and ultimately get rid of their resources. So potentially having a Sea King in your deck wouldn't be the worst one of in the world, just to give yourself a bit of extra discard on top of all your crushing hammers and everything else that you have going on. Everyone else is pretty much in agreement with me, though. More of a gimmick, potential one of in a deck, uh, more than anything guaranteed. We move on to the Lightning stuff. We start off with a Stage 1 Boltund. Um, I think... The Lightning decks that I'm expecting to be strong just don't really need to feature a Bolt Und at all. Um, big Bite for two colors is 50, and your opponent's active can't retreat. And then uh, Fighting Bite for Lightning and two colorless. Um, if your active, or sorry, if your opponent's active is a V or GX, you do 90 more damage. So 180 for three. Not all that efficient for Lightning stuff, even though you do have Mountain and you have uh, Coco Prism Star to try and accelerate this. You're never really going to make a Bolt on deck out of this, so I can only ever see it being like a Ditto style tech Pokemon, but it doesn't sound that great to me, um, especially when we have things like Tapu Koko V that can be a nice wall breaker that can get you through Keldeo now. We're not really in need of a like non-GX Pokemon that can be a wall breaker. It's kind of too expensive right now for me, even though its damage output can be buffed by Electro Power. I foresee more Peko and Picaron being really the only successful Lightning decks out there, and they just don't require a bolt on, so one star from me. We do move on to that more Peko V and V Max. This is the main reason why I've done multiple pie charts, because it's actually um, in this one where more people are hyped on the baby more Peko, myself included, compared to the V Max. So let's talk about both of these here. Just a quick note, I'm giving the basic more Peko a four star, and if I was, like, I'm keeping these on the same slide, but I would probably rate this one lower, this more Peko V Max. I think that's much more situational than the regular more, Pe uh, more Peko, just to get that out there. But let's talk about the basic first, 170 hit point, lightning type, of course, that has spark. You do one for 20, and 20 to one of your opponent's bench Pokemon, which is pretty okay. Um, it's just setting you up for game. Uh, to start getting some damage around the board. Obviously, this can be buffed early on with Electro Power. So if you do hit a couple early, you can try and get through some Jirachis and pressurize the opponent, which is never too bad. 
And then it has the electric wheel attack. For two lightning and a colorless, you do 150, discard energy from this guy, and then switch uh, this Pokemon with one of your bench. So we're going to try and form a hit and run based deck around this more Peko. Obviously, Lily's Pokedoll has proven itself to be a really, really phenomenal card. 150 damage, it's decent enough to be two shotting tag teams. It's going to be good enough to get through uh, V Max Pokemon as well, even with the help, of, well, thanks to the help of Electro Power, I should say. And also, Electro Powers can help us get around Malo Lanas from healing stuff as well. So, I really do like the damage output from this Morpeko. It's easily the best hit and run Pokemon we've had in terms of damage output on a basic for sure. It is really, really dangerous. Uh, so, every time you get a free turn from a doll, you're getting an extra, you know, at least 150 damage on people, which is excellent. This attack cost is pretty hefty for sure. But the Lightning Types is pretty blessed with its acceleration. You've got Coco, you've got Mountain. We can obviously use Recycle Energy for the discard and then keep putting it back onto your Morpeko. You can even think about having that Bead Supporter in here as well to make sure that you don't run out of stuff. Um, so I can easily foresee a very simple list, which is just Morpeko, high Dole Count, high Electro Powers. You've got the Coco, you've got all those Prism Star stuff. You've got Jirachis as well to pivot into if you can't find a doll or just to help you be consistent in those opening turns and then you pay a decent number of monies to try and disrupt your opponent from getting um their custom catcher combos to do with your more peco v because really that's what's what it's going to take to be able to access your bench um so yeah i think it's a pretty simple bread and butter hit and run deck but its damage output just seems good um good enough to certainly be an archetype every time you buy a turn by your opponent not having gusts just gives you such a huge advantage. It feels like if your opponent can't gust you almost every turn, um, you're going to be super far ahead. The VMAX could end up being like a one-off in this archetype as well. You get to jump all the way up to 300 hit points, and Super Discharge does a slightly better number for you. It's as if you've hit an Electro Power. For Lightning Lightning Colors, you do 180, and this does 20 to each of your opponent's bench. Again, maybe getting some stuff in range for you, which might not be too shabby. Um... And you have, again, Electro Powers on top of this sort of stuff. So if the wheel isn't quite enough to get through things, especially after people have done some healing, trying to get the VMAX into play and combine that with more Electro Powers could help you get over the line. And when it comes to that late game and your opponent is just like two prizes away, just one more Peko knockout away, you can evolve up into the VMAX and make it more difficult for them, force them into that seven prize game and make them have more resources to get through overall. So yeah, I can foresee this being a one-of in the just straight more Peko hit-and-run style deck. I'm pretty hyped on this archetype. I think it's going to be pretty solid. Tapu Koko V is also a card that I'm pretty hyped on. It's a 200 hit point lightning basic that has free retreat. That's one of the main reasons why I love the card, actually. It also has two attacks. Spike draw for one lightning does 20, and you get to draw two cards. Pretty good start-off attack um, if you really need to. Again, similar to more Peko's opening attack. Uh, that 20 can be buffed a little bit by early Electro Powers. It can even be enough to knock out um, Basics and like Jirachis and stuff if you really need it to. And there's also the Thunderous Bolt attack for two Lightning and a Colors. You do 200, and this, can't, this guy can't attack next turn. Never an issue when it already has Free Retreat and we have so many pivoting cards already in Picarom. We know that oftentimes Picarom will be a Jirachi-based engine, so you can get in and out of this Coco pretty freely. It's a V Pokemon that can get through Keldeo, which has really been something that Picarom has been missing for a long time. It's one of the reasons why Picarom sort of died off in this format pre-Sword and Shield, so getting an easy answer to Keldeo is a big deal. And this is also a V Pokemon and not a GX Pokemon, so you're much less weak to Low Puff. One of the other reasons why Picarom was sort of sparsely used in the pre-Sword and Shield format. So I think... Tapu Koko V fills those gaps very nicely. It's a nice pivot for you, and it's a nice V Pokemon that gets through Keldeo, and its attacks are just decent overall. Um, with Electro Power buffs, Thunderous Bolt is pretty scary. It's like using a Tag Bolt uh, just for the raw damage output, but you don't have to use your GX attack, which is great. And like I said, I think Picaram just becomes a very strong archetype in the future. Quick Ball is just amazing. It has great synergy to get out your Coco Prism style, and then you get rolling just so much more quickly. It also benefits from the turn one rule changes because if you go first with Picarom, you're absolutely fine with that because attached passing with Picarom is just fine because you're one step closer to Full Blitz on two. So, yeah, I think Coco V just slips into Picarom. That's why I've given it a four star because it's just an obvious include there. I could also see this going into more Peko as well. Um, just like I was saying with the VMAX, sometimes Thunderous Bolt is just enough damage to get you through. So setting up this guy also seems like decent value for sure. So four-star rating for Coco, just because he's going into the right homes, basically, as a nice one-off for sure. 
We move on to the psychic types now. I'm going to take a quick swig of water. Starting off with Galarian Rapidash. Uh, it's a stage one psychic type uh, that has 100 hit points, has the ability Pastel Veil. Each of your Pokemon can't be affected by any special conditions and remove any special conditions that are on this guy when it comes into play, which is great. Or, well, on all your guys when this comes into play. Um, it has an attack as well for a Psychic Colors. You do 30 and 30 more times the amount of energy on your opponent's active. Again, not that relevant. I think, as you can see on the screen already, there are better options to help us get around status conditions. Like I was saying with a Lumberry, uh, we have just a Skateboard, uh, Jirachi, and a bunch of decks. So you'll naturally have a lot of ways out of special conditions. We have Tag Team Engines that have Malolana, and PCL isn't seeing any play at all. So status conditions aren't that good right now. Uh, so therefore, Galarian Rapidash isn't going to be a stellar card at all. Gengar's a really interesting stage too. It has the ability Life Shaker as often as you like during your turn. You may move a damage counter from one of your Psychic Pokemon to another of your Psychic Pokemon. So it's damage swap Reuniclus, but way, way, way more limited. You can only move um, from a Psychic to a Psychic. So we really don't have many options right now for this Gengar. That's why he's not getting a much higher rating. Uh, because really... The only options I foresee with this guy are things like Muck Muck or Mew Mew. We don't have any V Max Pokemon, so 270 is our highest amount of hit points that we have, and we know that many archetypes out there can hit that 270 fairly easily. Um, even though we have things like Weak Guard, Faber is a constant in the format um, for at least things like Malamar right now. So I can certainly foresee that being an issue for making a tanking psychic style deck. There are very interesting ways that we can try and use healing. We can try and use last chance potion because we can life shaker off things um, to the point where they only have 30 left and you can just last chance potion to get rid of 120. There's a new NDDV that does a lot of healing as well. So the idea here is trying to build a tanking deck. Gengar gets set up, you take a hit, you life shake it off onto your other psychic stuff, like even onto your own Gengars if you want to, onto your own NDDs and even the new Wobbuffet V that we'll get onto later. Try and move it all off of that stuff and then just keep churning out damage with your tank in the front. Uh, things like Mewtwo and Muck Muck with a giant charm on could be pretty tanky. Um, I think the issue really for Gengar is that it's going to take up a lot of spaces. It's a stage two. You need to play candies. You need to play the stage twos themselves. You need to fit in the healing cards like the Indeedies and the last chance potions. If you want it to be Mew Mew, um, you probably won't ever have space because you need to have so many different attackers for Mew Mew itself. Uh, if it's going to be Muck Muck, the damage output is just pretty low. Yes, Muck Muck has his own inbuilt healing with his own attacks, but his, his damage output is still pretty mediocre. So I'm a little bit skeptical that, that Gengar is going to work. I think if I would try it, I'd try it out with a Muck Muck first um, and have Indeedies and Wob in there as well, which we'll get onto in a moment. But two star for the Gengar. I can certainly see him becoming a big threat if we ever get a big Psychic V Max Pokemon. That's when hit points start getting way higher. And then Life Shaker becomes much more live because your psychic stuff is going to be much more able to tank things, which is really important. In DDV, as I just mentioned, is a healer. It has the ability to watch over. You can just heal 20 from your active once during a turn. So it's basically the Shaman, but not limited to Grass Pokemon. The downside is that you are a two-prizer, of course. It also comes with a decent attack, actually. Um, it has Psychic for a Psychic and do Colorless. You do 10 and 60 more for each energy attached to your opponent's active Pokemon. That's not too shabby at all. Uh, this could end up being a tech in Mew Mew just because it can be, once again, a Keldeo answer, similar to what I was saying with the Victini. Um, and at the same time, it could be a nice um, Pokemon that hits for Psychic Weakness that isn't Psychic Weak itself and is also a two-prizer. So it could be nice in mirror matches against opposing Mew Mews, which could be pretty cool. In general, I think a lot of the time this Ndidi might only see play because it can heal things. And tanking does seem reasonable. I've already talked about Gengar, and there's a bunch of high hit point V Maxes. We've already seen the Lapras, but there are two other V Maxes that have really. Well, we've seen Ma uh, Lapras and uh, Morpeko. Um, but Stonejourner and Snorlax have even more hit points, and uh, Giant Charming or Buff Padding uh, for the Snorlax can really put them into crazy amounts of hit points. Ndidi on top of that is going to be really annoying to get through for a lot of stuff. So I can certainly see Ndidi being a tech card for some of these tanking V Maxes. So I'm giving it a three star for the options around those. Uh, not giving it a higher rating because it's just a maybe on those. At the moment, we already have Malolana. That might be enough. And at the same time, these healing style decks, especially the Gengar, seems very um, mediocre to me. I think potentially the Stone Journer and Snorlax are stronger versions that we'll look at a little bit later on. 
Poltergeist is a stage 1 60 hit point Pokemon, if you can believe that. Um, it has two attacks, tea time, forcing both players to draw two cards for a colorless, and Poltergeist for a psychic colorless, you do 50 times the amount of trainer cards in your opponent's hand. So uh, the tea time actually has nice synergy here, but you'd probably never put your Poltergeist in the line of fire because you're a two energy attacker. Um, being a 60 hit point Pokemon does give you great synergy with Elm. You can try and get all your basics down. You can also try and get your Poltergeist into hand. So Elm is good, not just on turn one, but throughout the entire game. You could try and synergize it with having things like Shedinja or Pidgeotto in your deck um, to try and get those rolling. I would also imagine you'd play a thin line of Malamar so you can try and get those Poltergeists off turn by turn by turn. And the idea is just trying to make your opponent have a bunch of cards. We've seen Gengar, Mimikyu with Omastar be a rogue deck. Potentially, Poltergeist could try and be the same thing. You could try and have the Omastar in your deck if you wanted to, but I imagine this deck wants to have a thick bench because you'll need to have Malamar in play and you probably want to have some draw behind you as well. You have some cool synergist, uh, synergistic supporters, Erika forcing both players to draw three and Surprise Box forcing trainers back into their hand could be nice. Ultimately, though, just how Gengar Mimikyu hasn't really succeeded to a great extent. Uh, it's never really fixed damage output and your opponent has ways of playing all these item cards. Um, and that's going to be really annoying for Poltergeist, so only give it the one star. Also, because it only has 60 hit points, you're going to get bodied by uh, Espeon Deoxys and all this other spread stuff. So, yeah, definitely a rogue. Wobbuffet V might be the final piece of the puzzle for Gengar-based decks. Um, it's a 220 hit point V Pokemon that has two attacks. Step back for two colorless switches. All damage counters on this Pokemon with those of your opponent's active Pokemon. So that's the whole combo we're going for here. You use Gengar, you try and put... 210 damage on Wobbuffet V, and then you make sure that your opponent doesn't have any damage on their active, or a lower amount of damage on their active at the very least. Then you um, move into your Wobbuffet and step back and try and put, like, throw the damage back over to them, basically. If you use the Giant Charm, you can put 240 on your opponent's Pokemon for 2 energy. That's actually really, really efficient, especially when you're healing that damage off yourself. It kind of make, uh, reminds me of when Mega Mewtwo was an archetype, used to use Shrine and have damage change available because so many things couldn't hit Mega Mewtwo for enough damage. I think that's why Wobbuffet is going to get a low rating from me because 220 and even 250, that's a really achievable number for a lot of cards. Um, I think we're in an era where 250 just isn't enough right now uh, for all the tag teams around and all that stuff. So um, I don't think Wobbuffet has the tanking potential on his own. Yes, he'd probably go in the Gengar deck just to step back and do some pseudo healing. But it may end up being better that you just have, um, instead of using this guy, you just use things like Last Chance Potions and Scoop Ups instead. And Wobbuffet is just sort of left in the background because it still takes two attachments and that's really annoying as well. Shadow Bind for two Psychic does 70 and they can't retreat, which can do some nice stalling, but never all that important. So just two star for Wob. For the potential, I think, again, same thing I said for Gengar. As soon as a big Psychic V Max comes out, we've got to revisit this Wob because he could end up being way more influential if that is the case. We start on the fighting types now. We have a stage one clay doll. For a colorless, you do 30 and confuse. And then for two fighting, the main reason why we look at this card, you do 200 damage. And this is 120 to itself. Now, knocking yourself out is obviously trash. <laughs> you never really want to do that. Yes, you can go into things like poker doll. So effectively, you force your opponent to gust you as a bit of a um, plan B when you do use explosion. Uh, but that is pretty awkward. 200 damage again, not really that spectacular. Being a fighting type is good for Picarom. Two fighting energies is annoying. You need to try and find some acceleration in there somewhere. Maybe the baby Zygarde or something if you're going to try and make a clay doll deck. If this is going to be a tech card, you need to already be playing fighting energies or at least like Aurora energies. If this is a tech, you might also think about using Expert Belt if you're going to become like an elaborate sort of Rosa style option. Um, you could also try and think about having uh, the Giant Charm, so you're not knocking yourself out, you're instead leaving yourself uh, with that 30 hit points that you've gained from the Charm. Uh, that's looking a bit more tempting, but again, the 200, even with Diancie and Dojo and stuff, it's still not enough, um, so definitely a gimmick overall. Graplocked also seems pretty gimmicky. For two fighting again, you have this Octolock. Uh, the attacks of your opponent's active require two colorless more, and it can't retreat. This effect lasts until this Pokemon is no longer your active and you can't apply more than one Octolock at a time. So, um, pretty interesting. Obviously, you're forcing the opponent to have a higher attack cost, trying to put them out of range of attacking, essentially, and making it so they can't retreat. This is obviously going to be annoying uh, for a certain bunch of archetypes. Um, some more than others, obviously, um, because a lot of archetypes in our format will have acceleration. There's potential for Frostmoth. 
There's ADP that has acceleration. Even um, if they don't get to use their ultimate ray, they have Zacian that can accelerate to itself with its ability, as well as uh, metal sources. Um, we have welder decks. So Grap Clocked, I think, is oftentimes going to be answered by decks that have this sort of uh, acceleration. If the acceleration is not enough, they have Gusting. They move Grap Locked out of the way, and then Octolock is no longer in effect. So things like Fion and stuff can be good enough to get you around it. And at the same time, they can change their active um, because they can just use Switch. <laughs> so, yeah, plenty of ways that Octolock can be broken, unfortunately. So I think this isn't really going to be a combo piece. Um, even if you are looking at controlling style decks with Karate Belt and just a fighting energy, I don't think Birds ever wants to play anything but water energy cards. So I think it's a little bit too niche. And I don't think he's strong enough as his own archetype. Um because you'll end up having to break your own Octolock to switch into things like Orangaroos and stuff if you want to try and make a Octolock Belelba style archetype. Overall, just the one star from me. Regirock V, a tanky 220 hit point basic that has Raging Hammer uh, for fighting colorless, 30 and 10 more for each damage counter on this guy. Not bad at all when you have that much hit points, uh, but overall, I think still just a nice option to have, but. Again, we have enough damage in the format that we can get around Raging Hammer a good amount of times. And it has the Rocky Tackle for two fighting and a colour. So you do 190. 190 can be buffed fairly nicely with Diancy Dojo and all that sort of stuff. But never really that dangerously. It can't get to the 270, which is the promised land, really. Um, so I think that's the biggest reason why I'm not a huge fan of Regirock. Also, it's pretty expensive. So again, you're going to need to have some... Energy acceleration in the form of things like Zygarde as well. That's the first one that comes to mind. Zygarde was obviously terrible when Unified Minds first came out, but we finally have Ball Search, so you have to look at him with a new uh, pair of eyes ready because Boost Fang can actually do good pressure against things. Um, it is really good early game acceleration and pressure. It can easily knock out things like Jirachis and stuff if you get a couple of Zygards down. So, yeah, I can um, foresee that being like a small rogue, but the Regirock isn't really a good enough target to attach to. So, overall, I'm not really sold on the card. Rhyperia is a fun stage two because I believe Megalium could be coming back. That's the only reason why I put this card in here um, because Bedrock Shake, his second attack, does 120 and 60 to each of, uh, well, each bench Pokemon with damage counters on it, both yours and your opponent's. So a small downside of damaging your own stuff, uh, but a huge upside if you've been able to spread around your opponent's board. Uh, we've seen previously things like Kingdra GX go into Meganium Swampert style decks. Maelstrom GX was a great way to spread damage around things and become really awkward. You could try and go for a Kingdra GX Maelstrom attack into a Rhyperia Bedrock Shake and do a huge amount of damage. Obviously it's convoluted and silly and stuff, but I wanted to throw it out there because we've seen sillier combos with Meganium previously and I just wanted to be aware that this was a thing. Stone Journey V, I'm pretty hyped on. I think it's a very good card. As I've already said, I believe in more Peko, I believe in Picarom. Therefore, I believe in Stone Journey as being a great check to those decks. I think it will certainly have decent times against those. And the amount of healing you can do will oftentimes be annoying for things like Zacian builds as well. So let's look at uh, Stone Journey in a bit more detail. 220 hit point fighting type as the basic. You have Guard Press, 1 for 40. And during your opponent's next turn, this Pokemon takes 20 less damage from attacks. That's even better. You're making yourself that little bit more tanky, which is fantastic. And 40 base is not bad at all. You can try and use things like Fine Band and Diancy Prism or Diancy Dojo to do 70. Dealing with Jirachis is still a bread and butter amount of damage turn one. And even then, just doing that early 70 poke can set up damage for things like Max Rock Fall on future turns. So that little prod is actually a really big reason why I like the Stone Journey V. I think it's excellent, uh, really an excellent sort of start off to your game. He also has Mega Kick uh, for three fighting. It does 150, not bad at all. But I think if you're ever playing Stone Journey, it's because you're playing that V Max. You jump up to 330 hit points, which is very tanky. You also have the Stone Gift attack for one fighting. You can attach a fighting from hand to your Pokemon and then heal 120 from that Pokemon. I think that's one of the reasons why I think this will certainly see play. You are slow, but you self-accelerate and you self-heal. I think with the Malolana combo in addition to this, you have a huge amount of healing, undoing damage that your opponent's doing to you until you're ready to start using Max Rockfall, which is 200 damage. Again, you can be buffing this with things like Diancy, Dojo, and all that other stuff. So that's really cool. I think with Ndidi and Malolana and your own Stone Gifts undoing so much damage from your opponent, you really will be annoying for a lot of things. Going back to that 40 damage guard press, I think there's a really cool combo you could be using. Seeing as though you're already going to be using a tag team engine more than likely because Guz Haller gets you 
your dojo, it gets you um, your giant charm or your fine band. You could also try and use unit energies and then have you Veltal GX as a Doom Count GX option. Guard Press does that 40, Doom Count can then finish things off. So that's a cool little niche combo that you could be using with a Stone Journey. I think it's a little thing that could be pretty cheeky and gives this deck a bit of stealthy damage in there as well. So a definite threat in the format for sure. I can foresee his type coverage being very strong. We know that Grass is a pretty weak archetype overall, so Stone Journey is pretty good for walling that. Um, also, you're hitting for the Lightning stuff, which is a big deal, and just out healing things like ADP and Luke Metal. Those sorts of things sound really appealing to me. So, yeah, Stone Journey, I'm pretty hyped on. It's, I think, the best VMAX in the set that we're getting. Galarian Goons, I'm also hyped on as we move on to the dark stuff. Um, the Zigzagoon, I've already referenced a few times in terms of a nice damage buff option. It has the Tantrum Head ability. Once during a turn, when you play this Pokemon from hand to bench, you can put one damage counter on one of your opponent's Pokemon. So, as I mentioned with Fine Band and Shrine, this can be a really important damage fixer in order to reach knockouts on things, which is fantastic. But we can go one step further and start evolving this guy as we look towards the Galarian Obstagoon. It's a 160 hit point dark type stage 2, very tanky, and it has the ability Violent Shout. Uh, when you evolve into him, you put three counters on one of your opponent's Pokemon. So it's a throwback to Crobat, of course, the surprise bite that we used to know and love, of course. Um, we're getting this all over again, and I think it's going to be a repeat of the bats where it's going to be very useful. It also has the attack Obstruct, which should not be slept on at all. For a dark colorless, you do 90, and during your opponent's next turn, prevent all damage done to this Pokemon by your opponent's basic Pokemon. That's walling a lot of the format, let me tell you. Um, I'm expecting a lot of tag teams to still be super viable, although I am expecting a handful of tag teams and VMAX, oh, sorry, a handful of evolutions and VMAXs to do okay. I'm really expecting the basics to still be the best in Sword and Shield meta, so Obstagoon obstructing that sort of option is going to be excellent. It might force um, things like Fion to be a big deal in decks, at least uh, like guaranteed one of in decks. If you are going to um, be forced out of the way with obstruct, you could try and have dolls in your deck. Uh, I think dolls are already pretty decent in this archetype because you need extra turns to attach to your Sableye V a lot of the time, which sounds pretty cool. So that's really the combo that I'm talking of here. You're setting up damage for your Sableye V. I'm going back to you Veltol GX as well. I think Doom Count GX gets really, really good next set. Uh, so get your, your Veltol while they're cheap. Um, I really think this goon, these goons do a lot of damage to help set up the math for the Sableyes. There's also things like Roxy Weezing you can be playing. There's also Shrine you can play. I still think tag teams will be dominating the game, by the way. So Shrine is still going to be a powerful card. Obstruct is great against a lot of decks. Very, very disruptive. And also, I think Lucky Egg can be the thing sustaining this deck, making sure that you can continue to draw cards, even though you're spending most of your resources getting uh, evolutions into play that won't draw you cards overall. I still think the Lucky Egg can come in clutch in that mid-game. And uh, Dolls can be very nice against uh, your opponent trying to use uh, Fion against the Obstruct attack. So I think there's a lot going on here. Obstruct, a very, very strong attack. Um, setting up Sableye as well, like, throughout the game, and also having that Yveltal GX option leads me to believe that this will be very, very strong. Um, the community are pretty much in agreement with me, just um, a little bit less hyped on the goons, I think. But I genuinely do think this goon deck will be very, very strong overall, personally. Uh, we move on to Nickit. Uh, it's a, a basic dark Pokemon that has, for a dark energy, Tempt. Your opponent shuffles their cards into their hand and then puts them to the bottom of the deck. Sorry, shuffles their hand and then puts it to the bottom of their deck and then draws three cards. Uh, we've seen many decks out there. They've functioned completely off of Miss Magia stamp combos, ruining people's day early on. Nickit is a one attachment basic that can try and do the same thing. Just put your opponent to a low hand size early on in the game. Could be really annoying. I think really Sable Goons is the only deck that's going to naturally play Dark Energy. But there is, of course, Aurora Energy and all that other stuff going on. We have Great Ball Search with Quick Ball. Nickit could end up being this really scary tech Pokemon that all sorts of decks play just to set your opponent to a low hand size early on, just like we've seen this Magius combo, because this is way easier to sort of get out, I think, in a lot of situations. So definitely something to bear in mind. I also think it could be an early game option for Pidgeotto. The reason why this is getting a one star is because I don't think many decks will choose to commit the spaces. I think it's a little bit inconsistent to try and do this in the early games. And you're spending your manual attachment, so a handful of decks already just say no immediately because you can't afford to spend your hand attachment in a lot of archetypes. So, yeah. Nick it. Very scary. 
I'm gonna come up against it on ladder and be really frustrated that I just brick on turn two or something like that because I've been tempted by the nicket. Uh, but other than that, I think it's pretty gimmicky. Sable IV, same thing for the goons. I rate this archetype as being a tier one or tier two contender. Uh, I really do think there's a lot going on here. Its damage output is very nice. It's doing the same modifier as Mimikyu, but instead of 30 for each counter on your opponent's active, it's 60, so Wicked Claws for two dark, 10 plus 60 for each damage counter on your opponent's active, which is crazy, crazy good. You also get the Awe Search attack, which is also just a nice addition to the deck. For a dark energy, you get to put a trainer from your discard pile into your hand. This can just get back, you know, turn one comms, turn one quick balls, any of that sort of stuff that you've played, you can just all search straight away, get that back straight into your hand uh, for next turn to try and access even more goons for you. Because that's what it's going to be all about, trying to get Roxy rolling, trying to get goons rolling. Uh, sometimes you can even spread damage with things like um, Psy Power that could easily go into this deck as well. There's even things like Distortion Door, Shrine. We have so many options of putting damage counters on our opponent's stuff these days that getting Wicked Claws rolling should not be too big of an issue at all. Uh, spreading damage on stuff is also great synergy with Shadow Box Mimikyu to shut down a bunch of abilities from stuff. So I can really foresee this having a good time against Mewtwo. I can see it doing good against like most tag team and VMAX stuff because the modifier is just so easy and strong. I think the only thing I'm really worried about as this archetype is the consistency elements. I'm kind of crossing my fingers that Lucky Egg is enough. Maybe having some extra evolutions in there is going to be nice. Um, to keep yourself ticking over, maybe like a Cincino or two in here, alongside a Ditto, just to work off the goons and stuff. It depends how thick you go with the goons line. There's also the option of having Inteleon in here as well to go with the Sableye, but overall, I think um, this archetype is certainly going to be a success. I like the um, spreading option. There's also the bead supporter option to get Wicked Claws working a little bit faster. I think because you're, you're a V Pokemon, Sableye is a bit safer from easy gust from great catcher and stuff so all these things combine to make me believe this archetype will be pretty solid you're a dark type with spread options so naturally you'll be pretty okay against um malamar and of course you have the obstruct obstagoon attack which is great against so many archetypes it's definitely gonna steal games just off of the obstruct alone so don't sleep on the obstagoon really that's one of the reasons why the sableye is so strong Toxicroak's the last dark type here it's a stage one that has the poison up ability just thought it was worth noting um if your opponent's active is poisoned, put two more counters on it for poison. Uh, unfortunately, the poison users that we have in the format are pretty terrible. I literally hot searched poison, and the best thing I could come up with was Shuckle GX using triple poison. And you try and spam a bunch of Toxic Rokes to do more damage, and that is really embarrassing. So we have terrible means of poisoning stuff. Uh, Kogus Trap is another way that we can poison things. And if you have enough Toxic Rokes, that can be a nice uh, modifier. But ultimately, it seems very, very niche. This is a double up on Surviper, so it's a fair trade. You're a stage one to get double the effect of a Surviper. So ultimately, if you have these stacking up on your board, because obviously these do stack, Poison, in theory, could be doing a huge amount between turns. But ultimately, pretty clunky. Don't really see a home for him. One uh, that sort of lies in wait until we get a good Poison user overall. We move on to the steel stuff, some of the most uh, interesting stuff here, because of course we have that Metal Saucer to bear in mind. We start off with a stage one Copper Raja. A 190 hit point stage one is pretty silly, let me tell you that. That is absolutely crazy. That's like Steelix type, uh, type hit points, really, really good. It has for two metal, Dig Drain 60 and Heal 30. And for three metal, the main reason why this is an interesting card, you do 220. If this guy has eight or more damage counters on it, it does nothing. So 220 for three. It's decent numbers. I think the reason why this is more appealing than other decks, oftentimes today I've said that 220 is not that great, but we have Perserker here. Perserker does a plus 20 for metal type attackers, so if you have multiple Perserkers, um, this Mighty Trunk will certainly get mighty and get very, very dangerous. Copper Raja, I said it had high hit points. You can even buff padding this guy to make him even tankier. A 240 hit point one prize Pokemon. They could sometimes be churning out like 270 or so. Sounds very, very awkward to deal with for sure. I think naturally Perserker is going to be the um, card you pair with this. I think there are a few other options here though as well. Obviously the three energy attachments is very awkward for Copper Raja. So trying to have some single energy attack Pokemon could be nice. Having uh, some of the Ultra Beast package like the Buzzwell, the Celesteela, maybe even the uh, Nihiligo. These could all be options that you have in here just for the off turns while you're just sat there trying to find your sources for your next Copper Raja. 
Or, of course, you could try and incorporate even more acceleration and have the Silvalli GX package, have disk reload at your availability, whilst also trying to use turbo drive onto benched um, copper adgers and cuff ants and stuff like that. That could be another option for you for sure. Obviously, that high hit points that you have on copper adger does get mitigated, um, so you might also need to incorporate some healing cards so you don't just have a copper adger that gets hit and then immediately it's useless. So you might need to have some Malolanas and all that other stuff. That's what makes me think this is a bit of a gimmick. It's expensive. You're going to have multiple stage ones no matter how you build this guy. And you need to also fit in some healing, which all points to a little bit awkward. But the raw stats, the fact that you can reach one shots with enough Perserkers in play, and the fact that you can be a 240 hit point stage one sounds pretty crazy to me. So worth playing around with. Definitely a fun one. Galarian Perserker is really awesome. I think uh, he's a great tool for metal decks, um, mainly because we have this amazing promo uh, Galarian Meowth. It was a promo in Japan, not certain if it's going to be in our main set, but at the very least we'll get it pretty soon, I'm sure. Once during a turn, you may discard two cards from hand. If you do, search your deck for a Galarian Perserker and get it straight to hand. So you don't need to worry about having extra ball search to try and find your Perserker. As long as you find this Meowth, you can easily go ahead and search the Perserker straight away. And it has that Steely Spirit. Your Metal Pokemon do 20 more damage to your opponent's active, just like Altaria or like Lorantis that we've seen in the past. But this is where it's different. We have a great user. Altaria never really had a great Dragon user. Um, that it could buff things with, and Altaria has been in a format where Ball Search has been terrible. This Perserker finds itself very easily via the Meowth, and even if it didn't, we have great Ball Search for this card now. Um, and we have Zacian. Zacian's great, right? Uh, Zacian plus ADP, again, Brave Blade going up to 260, then you, with one Perserker you do 280. That could be very good for ADP mirror matches. Um, and of course, you're already knocking out other tag teams with that buff without the need for things like Fine Band or anything else. So this 1-1 one, one line of a Perserker could easily be going into Zacian based decks. And there's, of course, the option. I think this option would only be open if we do have this promo Meowth. You just have a very high Perserker line and forego the ADP altogether and just go full Zacian, Turbo Zacian with um, like 3-3 three, three Perserker, something like that. And then the Brave Blade gets to high damage output on its own. Um, you can see the community are pretty much in line with me here for the rating of a freestar. But I really do foresee this being decent. Could be an easy one of in ADP builds and could be a multiple copies of in um, like straight Zacian if that's going to be an archetype as well. Galarian Stunfisk is a basic 120 hit point metal type that has the Steel Trap ability. If this Pokemon takes damage from an attack um, from your opponent's active, uh, discard one energy attached to your opponent's active Pokemon. This is a two retreat cost Pokemon, so fortunately we do have the Air Balloon that can help out here. And it can be another one of these pivot style Pokemon. I think it's unfortunate for Stunfisk that we have dolls already in the format. So that's going to be the thing that it competes with. And unfortunately, doll is just very, very good. So I can foresee that overtaking Stunfisk and not being that relevant, even in things like more Peko that wants to hit and run. Um, so I think that's going to be a big deal. Uh, you could think about this going into things like Pidgeotto Control, uh, the deck now that it can't use an Elm turn one, might need more turns just to disrupt the opponent and just have physically more basic Pokemon in their deck so they don't get donked on those opening turns. I think they'll more often than not going to turn to Jirachi, of course, just to draw them more cards. Um, but Stunfist could be another option just to, again, start that chain of discarding energies early on. But as with the community, I'm rating this as a one star. It's just not as good as a doll, basically. We come to... The best Pokemon of the set, Zacian V, 220 hit point metal type. I've already discussed him many times. Um, he has this Intrepid Sword ability. Once during a turn, you may look at the top three cards of your deck and attach any number of metal energy you find there to this Pokemon. Put the other cards into your hand. If you use this ability, your turn ends. So that is absolutely crazy. <laughs> Giving yourself a potential plus one attachment is nuts. Giving yourself a guaranteed draw three at the end of your turn is absolutely nuts. I think this Zacian ability alone is good enough for this card to be considered in almost every deck. If you go first, you've got quick balls in your deck, you can always end your turn on an intrepid sword. Even if you don't play metal energies, just draw three cards and he's done the job. It's like turn one using a Lele to try and grab a supporter card, you know? It's like ending your turn on a how, even though you're not able to use supporters on the first turn. I think this is a really, really good effect. Um, and Zacian V may end up going into all sorts of archetypes, even if they don't play 
Metal Energies. I think it's honestly that good. It, because you get to use it going first on your first turn, and then anytime you get reset stamped and you would just be passing because you've got nothing else to do, you can just Intrepid Sword instead and get into a healthy hand size. It's just a really, really nice ability that obviously doesn't get shot off by Power Plant either because it's a V Pokemon rather than a GX. So, yeah, really, really insane overall. Um, and then it has the Brave Blade attack. We've already mentioned a few times and how relevant these numbers are. For three metal, you do 230, and then next turn, this guy can't attack. You're naturally going to play Jirachi Engine and try and switch this guy in and out to undo the negative effect of Brave Blade, but this damage output is really good. 230 is already enough to deal with basic V Pokemon, uh, every basic GX out there as well, I think. Um, and when we have the push of ADP and potentially things like Fine Band or Perserka, that Brave Blade can also be knocking out tag team Pokemon, which is really, really awesome. Another thing I should mention about Intrepid Blade while I'm here is that you can see the Oranga on screen. It means that you can try and guarantee that attachment that much more easily. You can just put a Metal Energy that's currently in your hand, switch it with a card that's on your deck, and then when you end your turn, uh, the Intrepid Sword will guarantee that Metal Attachment from the Oranga. So that's great synergy. You've got the source of synergy, of course. It's not all about the ADP builds. I think it will also be tanking builds that try and use Frying Pan. Obviously, then you're no longer weak to fire, which is a big deal. And having Luke Metal can be very good against opposing ADP matches because you can try and full metal wall before or after they altered creation to get rid of some of the energy. And just the fact that you're reducing um, like 60 damage coming into your Zacian makes it very, very tanky indeed as a two prize Pokemon. It's essentially like a 280 hit point two prizer, which is just really, really annoying um, and doing good damage output on his own end. So yeah, I can foresee him being, once again, good with Perserker. Good with ADP, all good with Luke Metal, and a potential one of in every deck anyway, just because he draws you cards um, going first and when you get reset stamped. So, as you can see, the community obviously agree this card is crazy good, um, and it's going to really be at the front of the meta, I think. Zamazenta, unfortunately, falls a little bit short of uh, Zacian, at least currently. Right now, I have the four VMAXs that we have available on screen. There's also actually the Meowth VMAX, uh, but he's pretty terrible. The four VMAXs from this set, at least. And uh, I'm mentioning VMAX Pokemon because the Dauntless Shield is the real thing of note here with Zamazenta V, preventing all damage done to this Pokemon by attacks from your opponent's VMAX. Now, I've only rated Stone Journal a four star. I've rated the Morpeko, the Lapras, and even the Snorlax, spoiler. I rated all of those three stars. So I don't think they're going to be dominating the meta, and therefore I don't believe Zamazenta will be worth the space in all the Zacian metal decks. Now, he's still a metal attacker, he still does decent numbers and stuff, but he's just not a Zacian. Um, so he's not really worth the deck space, in my opinion. Assault Tackle for Metal Metal Colors is 130 and discard a special from your opponent's active. Yeah, that's fine. We, there's like weak guards, there's um, Aurora energies around, there's that sort of stuff. So you are hitting a good amount of stuff with Assault Tackle, but that like think of that number and then think if this was a Zacian instead, you'd just be knocking stuff out if you have the correct damage buffs around. So I think there just currently aren't enough powerful V Max Pokemon for me to want to play Zamazenta. Possibly the Luke Metal deck will play one copy just because you want to be even more tanky. And I think naturally you'd have an awkward Stone Journal matchup uh, without a Zamazenta. That's why I'm giving it the two star. Like it's a maybe one of in Zacian decks, but Zacian's just so good that I don't even want to play anything that isn't him. So <laughs> that's why I'm not too hyped on the Zamazenta. As more VMAXs come out and as they start to eventually dominate the game, which I imagine they will at some point. A Dauntless Shield will get way stronger, but always do bear in mind that they will always have the regular V Pokemon that they can still attack with. So the 230 hit points still could be, uh, you know, like churned through by their basic V Pokemon. So I don't think Zamazenta's ever going to be as annoying as things like Keldeo that we've seen in the past. Um, so I do just want to give this a two star overall. We move on to the colorless stuff. We're getting towards the end, guys. I know it's been a long time. I'm starting to lose my voice. I'm going to have another swig of water. And we come to a very hyped stage one. You can see a good number of people actually put this as a five-star card. Again, I'm a little bit more down to earth on this one, just giving it the three-star. But it is a thrifty boy. Once during a turn, you can discard a card from hand if you do draw two cards. It does sound familiar, of course. It is trade, just on a new name. Um, and we've known how crazy insane that, uh, that ability has been on Zoroark. Now... Obviously, you already know this isn't Zoroark. We're going to dispel that myth immediately. 
Zoroark was an attacker, therefore you were allowed to play four of him. He was DC compatible, he was tanky, you could use Acer Roller and stuff like that. Also, you were trading all the time so that you could use power supporters like Guzma. In our format, we have no powerful supporters. All of our supporters are draw supporters. That's why they're good. Uh, Zoroark was an era where you used his ability to do the drawing so that you could use the power supporters of Guzma and Acerola. That's completely different now. Cincino is just going to draw you into more draw supporters basically all the time. And Cincino doesn't work on his own, right? Um, because he's just got 90 hit points, very frail. And his attack does nothing. Right? It does 40, right? <laughs> and you can attach energy from your discard pile to your guys. That's nice if you're up against some controlling decks that are trying to get rid of your energy cards, sure. But it's never going to be the front man of any sort of archetype. So I really see this card as being a different option. It's just an option that comes into play against, you know, Zev Striker, Pidgeotto, Magcargo, Salazzle, Inteleon. It's just in the mix now. It's one of these options. And... I don't think it's always going to be better or worse than the others. I think it's just in that mix where sometimes it's better, sometimes it's worse. Pidgeotto, obviously, like, less hit points but more searchable with Elm. Makargo, better synergy with Oranguru, so it depends on what sort of deck you're rocking with. Zeb Striker, better if you're just playing a 1-1 line, in theory, for being a better means of stamp-proofing yourself. But Cincino does work throughout the entire game to help you deck thin and draw additional cards. So there's a, I think it's slightly better than Zeb Striker overall. Um... Salazzle is just a different kettle of fish because it's just more draw in general, but more specific discard. And Inteleon is a stage two, so it is also slightly different. But ultimately, I think Cincino is at the very least always a consideration if you're playing Ditto as a one of. And all of these cards, like all of these cards that we have seen, really it's only been Pidgeotto that we've seen a lot of recently because it has the best search available. Zeb Strikers still sometimes work its way into some decks just because it's important enough to have a stamp proofing mechanism. But I think all of these cards, you can foresee them seeing a lot more play. I think definitely the Mag Cargo in particular um, and the Cincino. They'll start seeing a lot more play now just because we have better ball search for these cards and they seem a lot better. One thing that could end up being the case is that Cincino takes the place of Pidgeotto in hand control um, because it has more hit points. So you're basically just playing Pidgeotto control, but you have more health so you don't lose to Mewtwo quite as badly or specifically SBDO and like Roxy shenanigans, I should say. Um, so there's definitely potential that this becomes the new face of control. Um, yes, you're discarding cards the entire time, so you probably have to warp your deck slightly differently to Pidgeotto. You probably need to have things like Brock's Grit in there to recover things, so you physically have more cards that you can bin off again with Thrifty. Um, so it does work a little bit differently, but we've seen Zoro Control be a deck over and over again, uh, since its, uh, time in the game. Obviously, Zoro Control had an attacking element to it. Cincino you know, will be a pure control deck, similar to how Pidgeotto is, but essentially it has a bigger trade-off of hit points. I'm not certain if it's better or worse than Airmail, because you don't grow the hand quite as much as Airmail physically grows a hand, uh, but you do see like the same number of cards, um, and you filter a lot quicker as well, so you can play a lot more superfluous cards just to get your combo going, that you can then just thrifty away to dig even deeper into the deck. So I can certainly see Cincino being... A better option than Pidgeotto now that the first turn rule changes have happened and you just have more hit points and we have better ball search. That might be where we ever see, like if we are ever going to see a 4-4 Cincino line, it'll be in something like that. Uh, otherwise, I can foresee this being like a 2-2 of option in all sorts of other decks, but you have to weigh up its strengths and weaknesses compared to all these other options that you see on the screen. And even if all these other options aren't the best idea, you could even just compare this with like Lucky Egg. Sometimes a Lucky Egg is just going to be stronger than having any of these cards on screen as well. So I'm just going to get the three star. I don't think it's like guaranteed to go in. Zacian, it probably doesn't have space to go into Mewtwo. It probably won't go into Picarom either. Picarom never really played Zebra. Um, so some of the top contenders I'm thinking of right now, I don't think they're going to have space or really want to have a Cincino in play. I mean, everyone would want to have a Cincino in play, but it's more deck space, right? And they won't have search priorities for this sort of card. Um, so I can foresee a lot of archetypes not choosing to play Cincino, uh, but I also foresee this being like a 2-2 of sometimes in all sorts of decks. And I'll never really bat an eyelid if I see a Cincino hit the board because at the very least it's getting you cards and drawing cards is never bad. We all know that. Onto Cramorant V, another card that's a little bit more hyped by the community. Um, it's a colorless 200 hit points Pokemon um, that has two attacks. The first is Beak Catch. You can search your deck for up to two cards and put them into your hand, then shuffle your deck. Very similar to the Rogue Ring from Hooper GX. 
Hooper GX ended up being like a decent card in Dark Box. Dark Box obviously flopped as an archetype, but the Hooper GX was certainly a good card in that deck. Um, so Cramorant is never really the worst starter for you. If you just happen to start this guy, you're never going to feel too bad because you can at least beak catch to try and get some cards out of your deck to get your strategy rolling. Uh, but I do foresee this card being better as a late game option thanks to its spit shot attack. For three colorless, you discard all energy from this guy and you do a 160 snipe to one of your opponent's Dedenes. Oh, sorry, I mean Pokemon. But yeah, uh, <laughs> this is basically just going to be a sniper, right? Um, we all know what this guy is up to. He's trying to close the game on a welder or on a few psychic recharges or whatever else. You're a colorless guy, so you have all the acceleration options available to you in the world. And instead of needing gust for game, you can just snipe for game. And I think that's a decent option. Um, I'm just going to stick with a three-star rating right now. Yes, it's flexible and could be in a bunch of things. And I'm obviously going to pick up one copy of this no matter what. Um, but I don't think it's like guaranteed to be in anything. I think if you're a welder deck, you already have nine tails available. Uh, Malamar already has so much bench... Um, like sniping available to it already um that you shouldn't really be yearning for a two prizer rillaboom's like a flop deck and i also think quag style decks are going to be pretty poor so um i think it's not really although there are so many options for this card i don't think it's like yearning like there's no deck out there currently that's yearning for this cramorant to come in and save them and be an option to deal with to dene i think all of these decks have easily enough options to deal with that or if they don't they're not stellar decks in their own right so just gonna give this guy a three star but he is certainly versatile and again it's one of these cards where if your opponent's playing a one of like yeah i can see why you would it's just another means of trying to achieve game rather than needing physical gust which is obviously pretty decent Meowth V and V Max aren't from the set. Obviously, these are promos. They're actually legal. Um, I think they're legal for play now, possibly. Um, but I thought I'd cover them in this video because I haven't really had the chance to anywhere else. Because, I mean, I'm just going to do it quickly. They're pretty poor cards, right? Uh, the Meowth um, does 30 and draw a card, and then 130 for three. And then the Meowth V Max has 300 hit points, and then uh, G Max Gold Rush uh, for four colors does 200, and you draw three. Uh, drawing cards is obviously, again, never a bad thing. 4 energy is a bit awkward because even with 3 CE, you still need to have manual attachments in there, which is a shame. 300 base hit points isn't great either because you still get caught up with um, Reshizard and Family Zard as well from Hidden Fates. Um, so you still get bopped by a lot of things. You probably need the help of things like uh, Giant Charm, which is a bit annoying. And ultimately, you're pretty much just worse than Snorlax VMAX. So I'm just going to move on to uh, the other cards. Just... Uh, take my word for it that Snorlax is going to be stronger. You'll see why in a sec. <laughs> um, Noctowl is um, an interesting stage one. It has the Spirits off into the mountains. For three colorless, you shuffle one of your opponent's bench Pokemon and all cards attached to it into your opponent's deck. Then you shuffle this Pokemon and all cards attached to it into your deck. If your opponent has no bench, uh, this attack does nothing. So the idea here is if you're already a 3 CE style deck, you can try and get rid of something your opponent's been trying to set up, which can be pretty decent. I think at the moment there aren't really many 3 CE decks out there. That's the reason why I'm not too hyped on Noctowl. Um, yes, Dugong could be coming back. Dugong was obviously a card that helped um, even off win the NAIC uh, with Zoroark. Uh, obviously with less ball search, Dugong has become useless. Um, but Dugong could be coming back into popularity seeing as though i think baby blounds with lucky egg gets way way better uh and ball search for dugong gets better um 3c decks might be coming back a little bit and noctowl could be a decent option even if you just have a ditto option for this noctowl you could try and do that i think if ever this card sees play um it's going to be in the sort of stinger persian style decks because they love having a shed load of options of pokemon because they can always just discard them to help improve the vengeance I think the thing that's annoying about the Noctowl, it's not the active, it's the bench. And oftentimes that works against you. So you might have to use something like a Fion to push things to the bench just so you can spirit them off and get them out of the way. Um, try and hurt your opponent's early game setup. You could even um, put, shuffle this guy in and go into a doll, which could be quite nice for some stalling options. So I think there's some kooky stuff you can go on with here. I think there aren't many 3 CE decks that I think are going to be that viable. That's the reason why I'm a little bit against this Noctowl, so I'm just giving it the one star. But it does remind me of Tapu Storm GX. And that was certainly a played card at the time, so something to bear in mind. 
Oranguru, I am in love with. You know I love me some Oranguru. <laughs> I've basically loved every single Oranguru card that they've printed, apart from the one psychic one that they did. Um, it's a 120 hit point basic that has the ability Ape Wisdom. Once during a turn, you may switch a card from your hand with the top card of your deck. This has obvious synergy with the Zacian that we've already talked about, obvious synergy with Mad Cargo GX, and with Smooth Over, which is incredible. And it has general synergy with the Dene and Professor's Research. And those are two cards that are absolutely insane in the game. <laughs> Professor's Research and Adenia have played in a whole heap of decks, which means Oranguru is a consideration in a whole heap of decks. The best reason why is because you get to protect cards. Think of having early reset stamps in hand, early custom catchers, Electra Powers, B-Strings, all these sorts of item cards that otherwise you would just Adenia away and never see the light of day again. Now you can Oranguru protect that card put it on top of the deck and guarantee that you draw back into it, which even gives you better odds, especially for having double custom catcher, because then essentially, if you're using a research, you're basically drawing six cards to try and hit a second custom catcher, which gives you decent odds, actually, uh, especially if you have all four of them around. So the idea here is it helps accelerate energies for things like Zacian and these Mad Cargos as a potential deck. And it just has obvious synergy for protecting key item cards. Customs and Stamps are the two big ones for decks in general. But there are all sorts of other decks that want to have specific pieces kept here and there as well. So I can easily see this being a one-of in all sorts of different builds. Um, I'm personally going to be playing in Zacian. Probably going to play it in Mewtwo as well and Picarom. So like, if that's not good enough, <laughs> I don't know why you wouldn't give this a 5 star. Yeah, this ape certainly does have great wisdom. We finish off the set review with Snorlax V and V Max. Snorlax is a 220 hit point basic that has Swallow Up, 3 for 60, and you heal from this Pokemon the same amount you did to your opponent's active. Nice bit of healing is good when you're probably going to want to be a healing deck in general with the amount of hit points you can see on that V Max. So it's a decent attack you can try and pull off. Um, if you do have things like Fine Band, you can be knocking out a Jirachi Turn 1 with some Welder Synergies there if you want to. It also has Falling Down, you do 170 and this Pokemon's now asleep for 4 energy, a little bit expensive, um, but something to bear in mind. Snorlax VMAX is an absolute behemoth, 340 hit points, and it has a 4 retreat cost, so you can buff padding this man to 390, which is pretty absurd. And it has the G-Max Fall attack, for 3 colors you do 60, plus 30 more for each of your benched Pokemon. So with a full bench you're doing 210. Not quite a Mega Rayquaza, but it's uh, it's pretty good damage overall. <laughs> um, so yeah, 3 CE compatibility, Welder compatibility. You can try and use Weak Guard if you want to, if you're worried about uh, things like Stone Journer. Uh, there's Indeedees, there's Malolana, there's Buff Padding available to make this guy an absolute big man for sure. Um, and still, I'm just rating it a 3 star. Um, I think a lot of the time, this guy's damage output is what really just depresses me. Uh, the fact that you're only doing 210 is just a really rough number, I think. You're still two-shotting things like Zacians and stuff, which is really annoying. Yes, you're probably a Welder deck, so you'll have some Fire-type support that can go in here. Maybe I'm being a bit harsh on the Snorlax, but I don't really see this being better than just a Turbo Zard build, um, because the damage output of the Fire stuff is just better overall, and your that deck never really had space to fit in, like a 2-2 line of Snorlax. I think that's, if ever we're going to see Snorlax, it's going to be like a 2-2 line and then you just squeeze in the triple accelerations. But the fire deck never really wants to do that because you want nine tails to be your gusting option. So you want to have as many spaces as possible working on just regular basic fires. So I think the deck that you want to put the Snorlax in, just there's no synergy there really, which really is kind of awkward. So instead you try and build this big um, tanky style build um, you're limited to four triple accelerations and you have to try and find them somehow. Uh, maybe Guz Haller could be good in here as well. If you're going to, if you're going to play Malolana as well and like buff padding, naturally you could try and play a couple Guz Hallers. Um, maybe just a thin welder package could be reasonable here. Um, so you kind of look away from the ability Zard genre and you just try and play a full on Snorlax VMAX style healing deck. Um, but again, the damage output is the thing that just sort of puts me off. Um, you're going to be two-shotting stuff, but you get negated by Malolanas from people quite a lot. Um, so that's going to be a little bit rough, I think. Um, I don't know. Maybe this is better than I'm giving it credit for. I'm, I'm kind of in the 3.5 category for this guy. I'm definitely going to try and build him, but I'm skeptical that he's going to be better than like 
what we're already seeing in Mewtwo that's going to be like all these decks are just going to be less like all the VMAX decks is just going to be less consistent than the all basic decks because you commit more deck spaces to physical um, like evolution cards and then you're going to get hit by Marnies and stuff and feel really awkward about it. Um, I'm not really sure what sort of setup Pokemon you want to have on your bench either. Maybe some Indeedies, maybe some draw engine Pokemon. Maybe this is where Cincino lives, just in a big Snorlax style deck. Cincino drawing you into more cards for like Malolana and digging towards those triple accelerations more consistently. Um, but yeah, I think the the raw hit points of this card makes me wary that it could even just be the face of like a stall deck. Like we've seen Werelord and stuff in the past, just because it had high health, nothing else mattered on the card at all. And that could certainly be the case again. Um, but I'm a little bit skeptical in its damage output. That's the only reason why I'm not giving this a much higher rating. Um, but I am a little bit nervous about this one. I think this potentially could be a four star as well. But yeah, that's where we're going to leave it, guys. Leave it a three star. Um, let me know how you're going to try and build this guy because he's super flexible as well overall. But yeah, that is going to be it, guys. Oh, man. That's been a long review for sure. The set's over 200 cards. And man, we reviewed a lot today. Um, as you can see here, I've got the breakdown. I've got the seven five-star cards on the screen as well. The Oranguru, the Zacian, the Saucer, the Quick Ball, the um, Professor's Research, the Marnie, and the Aurora Energy. Plenty of one-stars that have something of interest and plenty of other stuff in there as well. The community had an equal number of five-stars, but they actually had two different ones from me. Uh, they rated Marnie and Oranguru both four stars as the majority, and instead they had Frostmoth as a five and the Fishing Rod as a five as well. So even though we came out to the same number of fives, we w we didn't think they were the same ones overall. So I thought I'd just mention that as well. I've also got a new little feature t towards the end here. I do give a little breakdown a uh, summary of all the cards we reviewed today. So if it's a TLDR for your friend, you can just take screenshots of the next two slides that I'm going to show you. He doesn't have to sit here and <laughs> watch the whole video, or you can just make him skip to the end uh, to see the ratings overall, and he can go ahead and check out the cards. He or she can go ahead and check out the cards for themselves. Uh, but yeah, I thought this would be a nice um, thing for us, just to have a little breakdown of things overall. Oops, accidentally went backwards. Um, but yeah, like the summary on supporters, two absolutely stunning supporters that will be changing the game for sure. Marnie is super disruptive cards, which makes me a little bit concerned for VMAXs as a whole. Uh, I think all of them will suffer from the amount of Marnie that we'll see play. I think she's going to be super disruptive and make only basic decks super viable. Um, I also think that um, Professor's Research is going to be in a whole heap of decks. A lot of things that have discard synergy out there right now. Um, and... Just people want to draw seven cards. That's a really good ability uh, or a really good effect. I also think there is some um, nod to bead here. I think it does open up doors for a bunch of different archetypes that may not have seen play before. For item cards, the big takeaway is a ball searcher back, uh, which is amazing. Source is going to be great acceleration for metal types. And the rod is going to be fantastic for um, recovery, for um, non-GX stuff for sure. For tools, we have great options. We have damage modifiers. Uh, extra health and we have a potential consistency booster in the egg aurora energy good for all sorts of dark archetypes as well a summary on pokemon grass stuff doesn't seem to get a lot at all rillaboom is probably going to end up being a flop in my opinion fire stuff we have some great basics that can go in addition to um the abilities our deck and the mewtwo decks and also torkoal could end up going in mag cargo to a whole new fire style archetype the water stuff i'm unfortunately not rating all that high. I think Lapras, just it's not the right time. It's type cover, it's uh, weakness is a little bit awkward, and you're playing a multiple stage one deck, which doesn't seem all that consistent to me. Uh, Frostmoth is de definitely a card lying in wait for a better target, in my opinion. More Peko is going to be the face of a new archetype, I believe, a new hit and run coming into the format. Coco V can go into that deck as well as Picarom, which will be returning, I think, thanks to the ball search we get back. Um, Gengar could end up making its little own rogue thing. Indeed, he seems to be the most promising psychic type because of its splash ability for all these sorts of tanking builds. Um, I think Stone Jonah VMAX might be the best tanking build out there thanks to his own stone gift having additional healing on top of everything else that you get and that he has good type coverage. I think for dark stuff, it's all about the goons, really. For metal stuff, obviously the Perserker and Zacian steal the show. And for the colorless stuff, uh, we've got Trade Back. <laughs> we've got a good Sniper. We've got an Orangri, which is busted in so many decks, and a potential other VMAX in Snorlax as well. So thanks so much for watching, guys. This has been a long, old review. Let me know your thoughts. This is taking me a long time to put together, gather my thoughts and all that good stuff. I'm going to be going on to Sword and Shield decks very soon this week, which is going to be fantastic. I'm also going to get 
going to get an impact of Sword and Shield video on the go as well, as top 10s and all that good stuff. So keep an eye out for Sword and Shield um, content. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Thanks so much for watching, guys. It has been Joe from Omnipoke, and I need to lie down. See you guys next time.